All righty. Hello everyone, it is time for another live stream. Um, so, <laughs> you would think I'd have everything ready. Hey Mike, welcome for, welcome for joining, and uh, <laughs> hopefully my English will get better as this stream keeps going. I need to find one of these, sorry. Actually, I'll find two of them. All right. <laughs> All right, so let's get into this topic today. Uh, what we're going to do is talk about algae, but before we get started, a couple of things of business. I need to remind you that I'm giving away five issues of Coral Magazine. So if you were hoping to get an issue, I need you to put your name into the running so that our moderator, Andrea, can pick five people. You need to live in the U.S. because I'm paying for the postage myself. So what will end up happening is you will get an envelope that looks like this, that has Elo's Reef on it, and uh, it'll have your Coral Magazine in there. I just got my newest one in the mail yesterday. I haven't even unwrapped the plastic off of it, but these are an annual subscription, and you get six issues a year. It's like $36, I think. And if you want the electronic version without getting a printed copy, it's a little bit less per year. So you have that option, too, if you don't want something to be mailed to you. Um, if you're saying, I want to save the environment. For me, I love holding a book or a magazine and flipping through it. It's, uh, I don't know, it feels more real versus just reading stuff on the internet. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's my preference. I love a subscription. I've been subscribed to Coral for a very long time. I've mentioned it many times, and we're giving away five copies this week, just like we've done the last couple of weeks, and I just mailed them out. So uh, we had some people chosen last week. I have their addresses. I'm mailing everything out on Monday. So... Um, Basically, 10 issues are going out. Also, when we get to the... Now, the live stream is always a topic that goes about 45 minutes, and then after that, maybe, I don't know, a little longer, and then we jump into the question and answer period, and that's what makes the stream so long. <laughs> so, if this is your first time on the stream and you're wondering, well, why is it three hours or whatever the time period is, it's just me answering your questions, trying to help you be more successful. So, if you will... Uh, keep that in mind. That would be helpful. Realize you can just watch the first hour and just stop. Or you could hit pause and play the rest later while you're working on your tank or driving your car or whatever it is you do when you while away the time. I do share a lot of stories when I'm going through the Q&A because things pop into my head. I'm like, oh yeah, I can tell you about this. Um, now, this is our 117th live stream, so do I have any stories left? I don't know, but uh, I will do my best. So today we're going to talk about algae, and the problem is, is that people see a bunch of algae in their tank, or they see the algae growing and they do nothing about it, they're not sure what to do about it, they keep looking at it, and then eventually they can't stand it, and then they're like, what happened, why does my tank looks like, look like this, and how do I make it get better? So, where does algae come from in the first place? Uh, it's going to be nutrients in the tank, and it's going to be light cast down upon it. And the more of both that you have, the more algae that can grow. So we want to reduce the volume of that uh, a couple different ways. Now, invariably, I get videos, I get pictures sent to me, or they'll post something online in a group, and they'll say, Hey, I have all this hair algae coming out of my new rock. I start with a nice, clean tank. I don't understand how this could even have happened. And it's basically part of the uglies that your tank will go through. It's actually kind of normal. And <clears throat> I, I guess, you know, I'm trying to compare it to something in the real world. Because even coral reefs in the ocean have a lot of algae in them. It's actually unfortunate. There's even cyanobacteria, which is not algae, that shows up and covers the rock or covers the sand. And you're just thinking, ah, oh, even the ocean has cyano. What a bummer. You know, they need ChemiClean. <laughs> but we... Uh, we just want to keep it under control in our tank. And usually what happens is you've seen other people's tanks that are so pristine and so pretty that you're thinking, well, I should be able to do that. And that's why we're talking about this today, because I absolutely believe that you can do that. And I do believe that you can solve the problem. So right off the bat, before we go any further, <clears throat> I'm just going to plant a thought in your head. You have this tank full of algae and you can't stand it. And you want it solved. 
just keep this idea in mind. If I told you that for $200 you could solve this problem, would you just spend the 200 bucks and move on with your life, or do you want to DIY it and struggle your way through it? <laughs> it's just something I want you to kind of think about as we get into, you know, this discussion further, because a lot of times it's going to come down to adding and beefing up your cleaning crew, which no one ever has enough of. It just, invariably, people are like, oh yeah, I have some snails, or I, I'm scared of hermits, or whatever, and they have algae problems. And then you've got others that have a cleanup crew and they don't have algae problems. And so they have bought the crew. So you're gonna have to spend some money. Now, if you wanna be cheap or if you want to you know, save money, which I understand, or you might even say they're, they cost so much, I can't afford it. I understand all of that. And then that just means you become the cleanup crew. <clears throat> now, it would be best if you knew what kind of algae you're dealing with in the first place. And if you go to milosreef.com and you go to the menu at the top, it'll say Critter ID, and you click on that, and there's an algae section with a lot of pictures of different algae for you to, you know, peruse and see what matches your tank. And that way you can determine, do you have bryopsis? Do you have derbacea, which is green hair algae? Do you have bubble algae? Do you have red bubble algae? You know, do those, does it matter that it's red or green? <clears throat> you also want to find out if there is a if it's happening specifically on a certain rock. Is it all your rocks? Is it the top of the rocks? Is it one rock, but everything else in the tank is clean? Because if that's the case, I'm just gonna go off tangent for a second. If it's that one rock, I might pull that rock and go deal with it elsewhere. Maybe even put it in a barrel of salt water with some circulation and darkness for a couple of months and get the phosphate out of that rock and then reintroduce the rock later into my tank. Uh, like I said, if you have a problem rock, I would pull it. I wouldn't sit there and say, but I love that rock. It's like that rock is a nightmare. So you might have to remove that one. But I want to show you some of the things you can use to solve your problem in your tank. So the first thing you're going to need, and uh, I can't emphasize this enough. Every Saturday I'd say to everyone, please test your water. So this is the Elos phosphate test kit. This one measures from zero all the way up to... <laughs> I'm always up there, so I don't even know the, high, the highest number. The highest number is 1, and I have beat that number before. I've done it. My tank will get much higher than 1.0. It happens. And that's because I love to feed my babies, and uh, just like I like to feed myself. <laughs> so I uh, would encourage you to find out what your phosphate level is, and if you don't have that test kit, you need to buy it. I do sell that exact kit on my website. It's the one I use myself, so I recommend it. But you could use Salifert if you like. You can use the Hanna Checker, but the Hanna Checker has been kind of frustrating for some people because some people are buying the ultra low Hanna Checker because they think they'll always be at zero or they absolutely are at zero. And so they need very, very fine measurements versus PPM, parts per million, which is what I'm using because I always have some phosphate. So when I have a choice, even ELO sells a ultra low phosphate checker or phosphate test kit. I'm like, why would I ever need that? <laughs> I have phosphate. I know I do. I'm not running at zero. I'm, I'm never running at zero. I have a reef that's six and a half years old. I've got fish that are 16, 17 years old. I keep feeding them. What on earth would I uh, do with zero phosphate? It's never going to happen. So I get a realistic kit. But if you always have absolute zero, you might need the ultra low kit. <clears throat> also, your tank is going to need a little bit of phosphate, whether you like it or not. Uh, some people are even dosing products to bring phosphates up slightly. I just feel like if you feed more, it's going to happen, but I could be wrong. I mean, I hear people saying, I feed all the time and nothing's changing, and I just don't know how that's possible. I, maybe, you know, maybe you're feeding more, but little amounts because you're nervous, you know? And then, of course, you don't want to grow algae, so I understand that. Also, there's a thing that is well-known, um, I, I, I'm not a scientist, I can't explain it exactly, I can just reason my way through it. And that is, if you have a tank full of algae, you have phosphate. Whether your kit says zero or not, you got phosphate. The plants are absorbing it, they're growing on it, they're lush, they're green, they're waving back and forth in the flow, you have phosphate. And the best way to prove that, you've got two methods. <clears throat> Number one, you can reach in the tank and rip a whole bunch out, and then test your water about 30 minutes later and see if you still have zero phosphate. I'm pretty sure you will not get that measurement that time. You're going to get a number. The other trick, or the method I use, which is I use to control my phosphates, <clears throat> is Phosphator X. And this product has been around for, I don't know, 11, well, 
This product has been around for about 11 years. Before that, it was called phosphate control. Before some law in California said you can't use the word control and they had to rename it. But I've been using this stuff <clears throat> since probably 2007. And this is something you just drip in the tank and the water turns cloudy because the phosphate that's in the water will turn into a solid so it can be exported into a filter sock or it can be exported into, you know, via the protein skimmer. Uh, some people say, can I use it in a little tank? And I always am a little nervous for the small tanks, like the, the Nanos and the Picos, because the filtration usually isn't that great on those tanks. And I would like to see you rig something up to basically pump water out of that small tank into like a bucket with a filter sock in the top, and it goes into the bucket and then drains back into the tank. And you, you'll need extra water in the bucket, obviously, to make it all work. But I figure you can puzzle that together. Uh, for that temporary overnight, overnight or during the afternoon thing you're going to do. Because this is not an everyday thing. This is something you use occasionally to bring phosphates back down. And my tank on average averages between 0.1 and 0.75. It just does. <clears throat> so it's a lot. And I know a lot of you are like <gasps> gasping in shock because you think 0.03 is the ideal number. And while that is the ideal number, you can see that the corals can adapt. So... Rather than chasing some arbitrary number, we definitely want to stay within a certain range. We want to avoid spikes and falls. I have some people say, don't bring it down too quickly, but I have done that many times with phosphate Rx with no adverse conditions. I haven't lost any fish. I haven't lost any corals. Nothing turns white. I don't have things gasping on the bottom. I don't know why I can do that so easily, but I have been using it in a 280-gallon tank. I used it in a 100-gallon trough when the 280 leaked. I used it in a 400-gallon tank, and then this tank leaked, and I had to put everything in a 215 and I dosed that tank. And then I put it back into this tank when I had the 400 going again. So, I mean, I've used in different size water volumes, but I've never used it like on a little tank. Never used it on a 55, never used it on a 29. Uh, so, you know, maybe conditions are slightly different. Maybe the equipment, like I said, the filtration is not great enough for it. But the 10 micron sock can work with any tank. You just have to rig it. <laughs> you need something that can hold the sock. You need a power head that can pump water out of the tank into the sock and trap the flocculent, that foggy stuff. And what you're doing is you're removing the phosphate from the water, which starves the algae, and the algae weakens to where you can remove it. So I have a video that I shared probably four years ago on this channel about how to remove green hair algae and what my method is. And my method is to put in phosphate Rx, wait three days, um, because by then the phosphates are now the water for a couple of days and the plants are weaker. And then you can reach in your tank and you can start peeling it off the rock where it comes off pretty easily. But there's another step that's in the video, and that's this magic bowl. I've had this thing forever. <laughs> so it's kind of fun that I can bring it in a video four years later. Same bowl. And you put in some tap water in here, you reach into the tank, you grab some algae, you pinch it in your fingers, and you pull. Take your hand out of the tank and you put it in the bowl of water, rinse your fingers off, put it back in the tank clean and reach in and pinch some more. And you keep pinching and pinching and pinching and rinsing and pinching and rinsing. And pin you do this over and over until you can't stand it. You just can't, you know, you're like, oh my God, my neck, my back, I can't take it anymore. Then stop, throw this away. And uh, the next day, do it again. And the next day, do it again. And keep removing it manually to reduce the volume of it that's in your tank. If you have lock line covered in algae, unscrew the lock line, go clean it in the sink with vinegar and water. If you have a cleaning magnet covered in algae, remove the cleaning magnet, scrub it with a toothbrush in the sink, and get it all clean. Get all the algae out of the tank as best you can, so that way there's less of it present, and then you've got to add a cleanup crew. And that's where I talked about spending $200. <laughs> maybe you can do it for 50, maybe you can do it for 80, maybe you can do it for 100, maybe you can do it for 300. I don't know what it's gonna cost you, but there's a lot of different companies that sell cleanup crews and they have package deals. And obviously the bigger the tank, the more you're gonna spend. But the thing is you need a bunch of guys chewing it down to keep it under control. And if you lack the cleanup crew, algae is gonna grow because there's nothing there to eat it. And to put in some magic fish and say, I, this fish is gonna eat it all is a dream. It's gonna eat some of it. It's gonna say, okay, cool, yeah, here's some. I found it, great, chomp, chomp. And then you put in other food and it's like, oh, I love Rod's food or I love LRS or I love Nori. And then it looks at that rock with the algae. It's like, you know, the stuff he drops in is so much better than this. I'm gonna start ignoring that. So that is the downside is that we can't just put in some animal and it's gonna solve the problem. It can work on it, but the cleanup crew will always work on it every single day because they're not getting the big meaty morsels that the fish are devouring or the corals are eating. They're getting scraps. They're getting crumbs. They're finding algae. They're cr uh, 
cropping it off with their little claws and they're consuming it and they're reducing it. So a long time ago, a friend of mine, he gave a talk and his talk said that you need to have uh, more cows in your tank. And he compared it to a field. Whenever you see a field full of cows, the, the grass is super short or the whatever, the whatever they eat. Do they eat grass? Do they eat hay? I don't know what they're eating, but they're eating something out there that's green and it's all level. And when you don't have cows, then it all grows tall, right? And so he said, you know, comparing it to a reef tank, we need more cows. And I always thought that's kind of an easy way to remember it. So let's uh, talk about some of the different critters that can help you. Uh, I don't want to leave anything out, and I want you to not leave anything out, because I think that's the other problem. I won't use this snail. I don't like this type of hermit crab. I'll never put an emerald crab in my tank again. Worst decisions you can ever make. I understand how you may have some cleanup crew critters that are going to be a little aggressive and can cause some chaos, but they're there for algae control. And to eliminate a piece of a natural biotope, just because you dislike something, that's not a good way to handle a reef tank because now you're trying to grow it with a force of will versus letting nature flourish. And, <laughs> you know, can you imagine if, you know, you hate hermit crabs, you hate them so much, you don't trust them whatsoever, and every time you go diving, you crush every hermit crab you can find in the ocean because you want them dead. You know, all you do is hurt the ocean. The ocean still has a cleanup crew, and we need a cleanup crew. So... Uh, one more thing that's behind me here is a set of RODI filters, and these fit inside your RODI uh, water filtration that we make water with. So these right here, you got your sediment filter. I believe all these are 5 micron. Yeah. So this is a sediment filter. This should be white. And if you open up your housing and take out something dirty brown, you waited much too long. It should maybe be slightly discolored, a little bit yellow. <laughs> it's also the cheapest filter. This is $5, and you could change this every single month if your source water is really bad. There's nothing, there's no rule about how often you change the sediment filter. On average, people should change it every six months, but if yours is turning brown or rusty, pull it out sooner, get rid of it, because as this clogs up, the water has a harder time passing through it, which makes even less water go to the next filter, and of course, starves the membrane on top. So you wanna make sure this stays clean and replaced frequently. Then it goes into a couple of carbon blocks, and these also are 5 micron. And these right here are, uh, well, like I said, carbon block. So it's a solid piece of carbon inside there, and water's flowing through the carbon. And it's removing chloramine and chlorine and met trace metals and uh, elements. Anything you can tr pull out of the water, it will. And these two filters plus the sediment protect the membrane that's on top. The membrane can last one to five years. It used to be three to five years, but apparently some people source water so bad, we've got to the point now where we have to say your membrane might only be good for one year, which is awful. For me, they last easily five years where I live, so I'm lucky in that regard. And the membrane is going to do all the work to remove as much stuff from the water, basically lowering the TDS, which is total dissolved solids, to the lowest point it possibly can, and then it flows out into what we call a DI. And this is a DI resin, this is a single cartridge that has cation and anion resin beads combined, and this polishes the last of the water to get you zero TDS. Now the reason I mentioned all these filters is because if you are trying to solve an algae problem, but your RODI filter system is old, and you haven't kept up with your filter changing, you could be adding stuff back into the water that's fueling the algae growth. Things could be going through the RO system that aren't being removed, such as iron, <laughs> which we know iron makes plants grow. So there's a possibility you're adding iron to your tank, which is fortifying the plants that you're trying to eliminate. So that's something just to keep in mind. It might be time to change your filters. And you know, here we are, the last day of February. You know, it'd be kind of cool if you change your filters on January 1st and July 1st, you know, every six months. And uh, if you are just now doing it, you know, like today or tomorrow, you know, just put a little sticker on the front of your RO unit that says filters change March 1st. And that way you know six months from now it's time to change them again. And staying ahead, making sure your, your water stays pure, it's really important if you're fighting algae. Another thing that you need to do is the container you're collecting the water in, that big vat, when's the last time you cleaned it? Because as stuff leaches out of it, it's in the water, now you put that water in your tank, and then your tank has algae, and you're like, where's this algae coming from? It could be something leaching off the container. I mean, it's simple little things like that, which is why the maintenance is so important that we clean things and replace things in a timely fashion, 
because all of those things will solve the algae problem. All right, so you've got great water, you are reducing your phosphates, and yet the algae um, is still a problem in your tank. There's a couple other things that people use that they really believe in. <clears throat> One of them is a product called Vibrant. I've never used it, so I have zero opinion on it. It might be great. I don't know. I don't use it. I don't know how to use it, <laughs> so don't ask me anything about Vibrant because I just don't know. But uh, you can Google it and you can see what other people say and maybe that'll work for you. I don't know. If um, you have green hair algae or you have uh, bryopsis algae or you have valonia algae, which is the bubble algae or you know the, the green bubbles that are like all over your rock, there's a product on the market that uh, is, it's a, it's a medication that is used for yeast infection, I believe. It's called fluconazole, and FluxRx can be used in your tank to make that stuff die off. So it makes these algaes die. Now, this box, the, actually the box is the same size no matter what amount you get. This one is rated for 100 gallons. There's one, a box that looks just like it that says in fine print on the side for 200 gallons. And then the third one is for 350 gallons. And I opened it up to look and there's a jar that's got this much powder in it. It was less much and this much. So they are actually sized <laughs> correctly. It's not some scam. It's just a way to save money uh, because you can get more of it in a single package instead of buying multiple small packages. And the fact is that when people were buying fluconazole, they had these caplets, they had to open them up and shake out the powder and open them up, you know, so if they were using 36 caplets, they'd open up and shake out the powder. This is just one vial of powder. You can just do the math and, you know, just easily scoop it into your, your system. Now, when you use FluxRx in your tank, you're going to want to stop the protein skimmer for at least a week. This is pretty much like a three-week treatment. And uh, the one thing that I have learned, it was a rumor at first, and many people have confirmed it, that if you, if you use it at triple the strength that's recommended, that's when it gets rid of bubble algae. So regular strength is going to be for your hair algae and your bryopsis, and triple strength for valonia. I wouldn't just throw in triple strength if you don't have valonia. There's no reason to overkill. Just use the right amount. But if you, you know, choose your battle, what are you working on? <laughs> uh, my frag tank has a bunch of bubble algae, so I'm very inclined to try triple strength in my tank and watch that stuff go away. Now, if you have a rock that is covered in algae and it's removable from the system, and this also goes for corals that are on frag plugs or, or mounted onto a small rock, you know, some, let's say you have some nugget of a rock and there's algae around the base and it's trying to get into the coral and you don't like that. If you can remove the coral from the tank, you would remove it, put it in a bowl, walk over to your kitchen sink, that way you're not dripping all over the floor, and then I would take some 3% peroxide. So this is just stuff I bought at Kroger um, a while back, super old. And uh, all you have to do is take some peroxide. You can actually, you know, because peroxide always has that little tiny opening on the very top where you can trickle it out. Uh, let's see, it's so white. All right, so you can either do that or you can take a syringe and you can draw the solution into the syringe. And then as you hold the rock over the sink, you can just trickle or drip it onto the actual algae area and not hit the coral itself. And just kind of work the algae and keep turning the rock and getting it, trying to get peroxide on every bit of the algae. And after about three minutes or so, go ahead and dunk that coral in a bowl of tank water. And then you can go put it back in your tank. And what will happen is the algae that was soaking in peroxide over the next couple of days or three days, especially if it's like a hair algae, it'll turn white and it'll turn clear and then it'll just fall off the rock, which is really nice. So that's a way to tackle a specific problem. If you have an overflow box in the back of your tank and all the teeth are filled with algae, you could do something along those lines as well. I, you know, lower the water level a little bit in the tank during a water change or when the return pump is off. And then you can go ahead, maybe with a sponge, and apply the peroxide in the teeth to kind of, you know, kill off the algae and get in there with a brush and kind of clean it all out. And then, you know, when you're all done and you've reduced or gotten eliminated most of it, then you can go ahead and turn the pumps back on. And, uh... Peroxide is not dangerous to your reef. Uh, we actually use it in a treatment when you're trying to get rid of uh, dinoflagellates. And so when we do that, we actually use 3% peroxide right in the tank. So that's just something to keep in mind that uh, can also be an application in a specific item <clears throat> and hopefully you know, get you on the right track. Uh, now, when it comes to... The cleanup crew itself, the important thing is that you've got to have a little bit of everything. 
So I, I really like red-legged hermits, not scarlet. Scarlets are beautiful, but they're expensive. You know, those could be three to six dollars a piece. But red legs aren't as expensive. Blue legs are the cheapest, but they're most, they are the most aggressive hermit crab. So I usually recommend red leg hermits to people to put in their tank. And, you know, this is a true story. I have an anemone cube over there, and it had some algae growing on the rock work, and I had all these snails in there, and I um, went up to the fish store, and I you know, talked to Frank. I said, hey, you know, I got this algae thing going on in my tank. It's weird. I haven't seen it take care of itself. You know, I understand what's going on. And he said, well, do you have any hermits in that crab, in that coral, in that, in that tank? And I was thinking, you know, I haven't bought hermits in a while. And so I came home with some hermits from the fish store, and I put them in the tank. And within a few hours, I'm looking at the rock work, and there he is just with his little claws. He's just ripping it off the rock. I was like, this is fantastic. And uh, I was like, how did I forget this? So it's really important not to dislike hermits that much. There is a chance some hermits might eat some snails. They're not going to eat all of them. They can't. It's just not going to happen. But typically, if a snail falls off the glass and lands on its back, it's, op it's fair game to whoever can get to it first, unless you rescue it. So you're going to need snails, and you're going to need hermits, and you need to stay on top of it. <laughs> you need to notice how your snails are doing each day, and if one's upside down, flip it over again. It can hold its own for a little while, it can retract into its shell, but it's going to keep sticking its foot out, trying to hopefully get flipped right side up. And a fish, like a wrasse, can go at it, hermits can go at it. Uh, starfish, whatever can grab it. So you need to correct that. The trochus snail is a great little snail because if it lands on its back, it can turn itself over again. The astrias are not. The astria turbo snail, um, the most common snail that most people buy, those things, they fall on their back and <laughs> you must rescue them or they will just die. And as your cleanup crew dies, they are adding to the phosphate level of your tank. So we do want to make sure we're keeping our animals alive and healthy and putting them where you need them most. So if you have an algae patch in your tank and you have snails all over the glass, pull them off the glass and put them on the algae where you need them to work. It's just like having gardeners out there trimming your bushes when they haven't cut the grass. You're like, cut my lawn. That's what I want done. Don't worry about the bushes. So it's the same thing with your snails. You put them where you need them. If they're not there later, put them back where you need them. You know? And like I said in the first place, rip off as much as you can in the first place. Um, also, one of the... Uh, viable plans when it comes to hair algae is a sea hare, which is this really cool little creature that is just a giant slug that's super soft, looks like a bunny, and it will devour hair algae, but you've got to remove it from the tank as soon as your algae is almost gone because it'll starve to death. So it has to always go to another tank full of algae, so have someone else in mind to get it to or get it back to the fish store. And whether they give you credit or not, you know, you're just like, whatever. It did what I needed, you know, it cost me, I don't even know what a sea hare costs. But let's say it cost you 20 bucks, and that sea hare spent the next week eating as much algae as possible. Then you take it back. Oh, well, it was a rental. Whatever. <laughs> just don't let it die in your tank. You don't want it to get sucked into a powerhead. You don't want it to just die. So we want to use it to remove algae, and then it has to go to the next tank full of algae. It's really important that you keep that in mind. Our own club used to share a, a sea hare from tank to tank, and his name was Rerun. <laughs> it's great. Now, you've got hermits, you've got snails, uh, we've got the sea hare. Uh, urchins are great at devouring algae. The diadema urchin is the one with the long spines. It's black. Um, the only problem is that they oftentimes will stab you in the knuckle when you're working in the tank, so you have to be aware of where they're located. Also, urchins can leave bite marks on the acrylic wall of your tank if your tank is made of acrylic. So it won't do damage to your glass. But if you have an acrylic overflow box, you might see bite marks on there. You'll see um, maybe a trail of white across your rock work where the urchin worked its way across. Uh, they can also eat coralline, so that's something to keep in mind, but it's not the end of the world because even as they eat it, they are breaking it up, they're sending flakes of it elsewhere into the tank, it's kind of reseeding it everywhere, so it's not the end of the world. But uh, another urchin that I like a lot is the tuxedo urchin, which has the blue stripes between its little needles or quills. And those are really nice, and uh, they can, they're really good at algae control as well. So you've got a couple of different urchins that come to mind. And then, of course, there's other things you need in your cleanup crew, which include a cucumber and a, a sand conch or a fighting conch, one of those two types that can work their way through, and Neisseria snails are eating the detritus in the sand bed, which all these things consuming food and waste will help eliminate or lower the phosphate levels in the tank versus food just rotting in the sand bed. So you want to 
it's, again, it's cleaning. <laughs> the cleanup crew, their name by definition is cleaning, so we want to use them, we want to utilize them, and if you don't have enough in your tank, you are making your life harder. So don't fear stocking up on cleanup crew, and you should really do it once a year. You know, when you first set up your tank, it's a brand new tank, there's no algae in there, worst time to add a cleanup crew because there's nothing for them to eat. But after the tank's been running for about three months or so, four months, and you know, you've got some livestock, you've got some fish, you know, you're, you're starting to go through, like I said, the ugly phase where the, the rocks keep changing colors, they turn red, they turn green, they, they kind of go into a brown, you know, it's just all these colors, and you're like, what is the deal? And then eventually it starts to look like live rock. And that's a great time to have a cleanup crew in the tank at that point because you want to get those hungry mouths from the fish store devouring algae. And that, I can't overemphasize how important that is. You have hermit crabs, you have snails, but they're lazy. <laughs> they're not doing the job. I know they're not doing the job because you have a tank full of algae. You need some new ones that are starving. And all the ones at the fish store are starving. Look at the tank that they are in when they're on display at the store. There is this tank filled with snails a tank filled with hermits, a tank filled with emerald crabs, and not a speck of algae in any of those tanks, right? They have nothing to eat. You put them in your tank and they're like, thank God, there's food everywhere I go. And they just start eating. And they're eating machines. And so you have to add new ones periodically. Now, if you don't want to buy a lot and you just want to buy a little bit at a time, it's going to cost you more. I do recommend, you know, buying in bulk, you know, getting a lot of things at one time, get a nice package, get it delivered to you on a good day of the week where uh, the weather is decent and there's no risk of it getting lost over the weekend and shipping. I always recommend if you're going to buy things online, have it delivered, you know, Tuesday to Thursday. Don't do a Friday delivery because Friday means if something goes wrong, you won't get it till Monday and odds are by Monday, nothing in that thing is in that box is alive. So why we even take the chance? And if your weather's crazy cold outside, like there was a guy a couple weeks ago mentioned that in front of his house on his front porch, it was minus 30. I would not be ordering cleanup crew at that time. <laughs> I just wouldn't. I would wait until spring. I would wait until it's about 70 degrees outside. 70, 80 degrees, that's the perfect time to get some shipping done and get your livestock. You've got a few months. Obviously, as the summer gets hotter and hotter, it's going to be again harder to get it. But then the fall finally hits. See, you could get a cleanup crew in the spring and one in the fall and have less risk of losing money and losing livestock. So you definitely want to have a cleaner crew in your tank. And those guys are super hungry, you know, and they will really do a good job for you. They get into all the spots you can't get. Now, emerald crabs get a bad rap, but I love them. Emerald crabs are, you know, just a little tiny guy that uh, will just go through your tank and they'll pick off the bubble algae off the rocks and they'll consume it. And I even found some emerald crabs do a miracle for me once. I used to have this really pretty tank by the front door of my house called the angled tank. The front pane was angled. And I had this calerpa that got in there. And the calerpa had taken root and I pull it out and it just kept coming out of this rock and coming out of this rock. And every couple of weeks I went in with tongs and I'm plucking this algae out and I'm just hating my life. Because <laughs> it keeps trying to spread, I keep trying to you know, remove it because you do not want an invasive algae inside your reef tank ever. And so I'm trying to remove it and remove it and remove it. And it's just, it's an ongoing battle and I'm never winning. And I, you know, every couple of weeks I'm just like, oh my God. And I go in there and I deal with it again. And then one time, I don't know what changed. It's not like I added new emerald crabs. They were just in the tank. They were part of my cleanup crew. And one day I looked in the tank and they were eating the calerpa. And I was like, what? And I was so excited. And so I pulled out the big pieces. So there's only little nubs left and they finished it off. And I was so happy about that. So emerald crabs can be beneficial to your tank. Yes, they might rip your zoanthids off a frag plug, or they might nip some polyps off of a coral. They're animals. They, you know, it's just like your dog. You have this awesome dog. You love your dog. You, you feed it. You take it to the vet. You give it you know, baths. You exercise it, and it chews on a pair of shoes. Do you get rid of the dog? No. You're just like, oh, it just happens. These things happen. If you're going to worry about every single thing you put in your tank potentially being a risk factor to a cleanup crew, maybe you're in the wrong hobby because nature is natural. It's just things are going to happen. It's not going to go according to the books. You can't control absolutely everything. And sometimes you just have to shrug your shoulders and say, all right, and get some new zoanthids or get something else that your tank will do well, that will do well in your tank that the cleanup crew doesn't care about. I mean, I've got some beautiful blastos. Uh, I've posted pictures of them a hundred times. 
and I had this rock covered, and now I've got about three or four polyps left, and I'm thinking the copper band is devouring them. I don't know. But I like the copper band, so... Oh well, I'm not gonna have Blastos in this tank anymore. It's not eating Acans, so I'm okay there. But I'm gonna either have to move what's left of these last couple of polyps, or I'm just gonna have to let them all go, and that's the end of it. And just be happy with all the other corals I have, instead of trying to fight tooth and nail to make one coral live. So, that is my opinion on that. Um, I do like cucumbers, and I specifically like tiger tail cucumbers. I bought one back in 2003, and there's probably nine in my reef. They actually will twist their bodies round and round until they break into two pieces, and you have two cucumbers. And I've even given a few away to a few people that are local in my area, and when they were like, hey, I want one of those. Okay. So I only had to buy the one. I have seen them walk up the glass. I've watched them go across the sand bed. I've seen them, uh, you know, peek out from under a coral. Like, there's one right now under that moon fabia that I posted a picture of on Instagram, and I can see that cucumber right underneath, just sleeping under there. Um, it is possible that they could get into a power head, and there are people out there that swear cucumbers will kill your tank. I have seen these cucumbers get into the Vortec. I've seen, I found them deep in the plumbing when I was replumbing, and I just opened the pipe and there was a cucumber inside there. I've had them in the refugium. I've never had them in the return pump or in the skimmer pump. It's always been, you know, somewhere in the system. But uh, I've never had anything bad happen. And maybe it's just because I have such a large water volume, I can get away with it. I don't know. I mean, certain things can happen, and bigger tanks are a little more forgiving. But uh, I wouldn't be fearful of a tiger tail cucumber. I would recommend it to pretty much anyone. And just having one in your tank is a good start. Like I said, you might get more over time. So, um, you know, if you see one near a pump and you're worried, move it. <laughs> just get your hand in the tank and put it somewhere else. And, uh, you know, buy it, buy it some time instead of just saying, well, let's see what happens now. Mark said it'd be fine. <laughs> I don't want you guys to, to, uh, just look for the worst case scenario. You can interact from time to time and fix something. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, uh, that's pretty much everything when it comes to algae control. Like I said, remove your phosphates, rip out all you can, add your cleanup crew, make sure your source water is is clean and pure. Uh, one more thing I do need to mention, we I've had a guy recently, he just has been bonkers about phosphate, and he's been testing everything under the sun. He keeps testing his DI water for phosphate. And I remember doing this myself. I remember testing, and I was like, oh my god, the phosphate's coming from my DI water, there's something wrong with my filter, there's something wrong with the resin, and it turns out you cannot measure DI water with a phosphate test kit that I'm aware of. So I'm putting a big huge asterisk there. If someone can correct me and say, no, 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 science can do it, that's great. As far as I can tell, we can't measure DI water for phosphate. And I think because the water is deionized, the chemical solution itself is different than salt water. So to grab our test kit and measure phosphate in DI water gives you a false reading. And you're like, oh no. And I went through a lot of testing. I went through a bunch of test kits and I went, you know, I, I tried different DI resins. I was doing everything I could and phosphates were always up. And I was like, what is going on? And then I got a Salifert test kit and I measured my DI water and it was zero. And I was like, oh. here I was so worried. So if you're using a HANA checker, if you're using different test kits and you're seeing a number in your DI, just stop testing your DI water for phosphate. Take your DI water, mix it with a brand new batch of salt, test that for phosphate. Odds are you're going to see zero. So don't you know, lose your mind trying to figure out what's going on with source water in that regard. Just stay on top of changing your filters and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the normal things. You know, Now, I didn't even talk about GFO because I don't use it. But if you're a GFO user, you want to make sure... Here's the thing. You have a reactor. You've got the GFO media in there, which you have to replace every so often maybe every two or three months. You have to make sure that it never turns into a rock because alkaline can turn into a stone, so you gotta make sure it's barely moving. And the other thing you need to do is you have to measure the water coming out of the reactor for phosphate. So if the phosphate is going in at, let's say, 0.1, and it's coming out zero, it's working great. If it goes in 0.1 and comes out 0.1, it's no good anymore. So what you could do is slow the flow through the phos, through the phos band or uh, different GFO products, until it comes out zero. Um, if you use a whole bunch, you're like, oh, well, I've got this big tank, I'm just gonna load it up with GFO. That's uh, actually dangerous to your tank. You can strip too much out of the water. 
And a lot of people set up a brand new tank with dry rock, dry sand, brand new salt water, and hook up a GFO reactor. <laughs> no wonder they can't measure any nitrate or phosphate for the first six months or a year and they're struggling so hard. You don't even need to use any kind of phosphate control until you have phosphate to control. So don't, uh, don't do that. Just hold off. And then, like I said, hook up a reactor, use the right amount. You know, it'll be recommended right on the packaging, tell you you need like a quarter cup per 25 gallons or whatever it is. And you're gonna need to rinse it really well before you hook it up to your tank so none of the fines, which is the metal rust, going into the tank and hitting the gills of your fish or irritating your corals. So it has to be very carefully rinsed. And then you hook it up to your tank, you know, in the sump preferably. You could even have the output going into a filter sock to catch anything that's coming out, but you wanna measure the output and you want to make sure that the output is coming out lower than the input. That's how a GFO reactor works. And if you like using GFO, because, and here's the thing, if you like using GFO and yet your tank's full of algae, the GFO is not doing anything to help your tank. So again, we have to figure out what will work in your system and what works for one person may not work for another, but these are general guidelines that whether you use phosphate or X or some other lanthanum based chloride uh, based product, or if you were using uh, GFO, and you could use four or five different flavors, you know, different brands, and like, well, this one doesn't work, but maybe Roafoss will. Roafoss won't work, so let me try the one from BRS, and you try all these different ones. You need to find out what it'll take to get the phosphate out of the water so that the algae can't grow. So that kind of covers everything I want to talk about, and now I want to start getting into your questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna scroll back up. I do wanna remind you, uh, and some of you probably already did it, but what we're doing now, because so many people are talking, I'm looking at you, JS. <laughs> so many of you guys are talking, I can't find the questions easily. So please put at me loves reef, and then put your question. That way I can quickly find your questions, I can jump to the answers. So, back at the top. And, uh, let's see. We still have about 13 minutes, I guess. Well, let's see, how far are we in? We're only in four. We've got 18 more minutes, and in that 18 minutes, Andrea's going to pick the five people that are going to get Coral Magazine. So if you haven't asked for it yet, we're talking about a free issue of Coral Magazine. And they're not paying me. I'm just doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just doing this. So if you want an issue of Coral Magazine and you know just to try out for yourself and see how you like it, um, I'm giving away five copies each week until I am out of my stash. So uh, you know just let us know. You got to live in the U.S. Okay. So I see the first at Me Loves Reef. How was that water change? I saw your post today with a milky bucket from the Nem Cube. So here's what I did. I had this blue barrel sitting next to the tank that had about 12 gallons of salt water in it. And I was, I actually had like 20 in there, I'd say, maybe 25. And I had to have that water here for the fish vet that came. And so when she used what she used, I still had some water left. It still had circulation. It still had a heater in there. It just been sitting there. And I thought, well, I want that barrel out of my way. So the first thing I did was I pumped all that water. Well, actually, I used a, a gallon pitcher. And I just poured it into a smaller bucket and I walked it into the back of the fish room. And I, you know, I hate carrying buckets of water, but I did it last night. And I dumped it into my sump. So my water level is like this high in the sump and suddenly it's like this high in the sump. So now I could use a, a gravel vac and I have a, a very large gravel vac tube with a long hose. And now my blue barrel is empty because I put all the water in the reef. I went ahead and I used the gravel vac to start sucking the detritus out of the sand bed in the anemone cube. And I only did like one quarter of the tank. I, I hit the corner that was the most offensive. Uh, it's the back side. When I put food in the tank, it oftentimes Due to the way the flow is in the tank, it goes around and hits that corner. So I focused on that corner last night. I had to avoid my walking dendro, who was right in the way. Um, I tried to siphon out some aptasia that were actually growing out of the sand. <laughs> and I removed a bunch of sludge. And uh, once I got about 10 gallons out of the system, I, I stopped. I mean, it wasn't... The thing is, if I really want to clean the sand bed in these tanks, I feel like I need to basically insert a tray that's submerged in the water and take things off the sand bed, put them in the tray, and then focus on that area or remove the corals into a bucket or something handy, you know, nearby. And then focus on the sand and then put the corals back on the clean sand. And I, w I think I want to do that with my main reef too. I think that, uh, you know, the, the, both tanks are six and a half years old. 
I want to get detritus out of them. I felt for a long time the anemone cube needs to have the sand bed siphoned. And uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of fish in a 60 gallon cube. That's two foot by two foot of sand. That's about two inches tall. And they're all pooping every day. So I really wanted to get that one. And so that's my plan is I'm going to work on that. I'm going to reach as much as I can reach. I'm not removing the rock. I'm not going to town. I'm just going to get what I can get to with that long tube and just work my way around and remove as much as I can. And uh, then I'm going to start doing it on the big tank. And I want to, I don't want to shock the reef. I don't want to shock the corals. So I'm thinking I would like to do a section at a time. So I may do up to this point one day and then wait a few days or a week and then work my way across this side if I get to any sand over here. And then work my way across the back side. And that'll be a, you know, again, I don't want to do it all at once. I think if I just work on a little bit at a time, I can remove quite a bit of waste that's amassed over the years. And it'll probably help my battle of nitrate and phosphate, you know, that uh, I call it a battle. It's like, I don't even care. It just is what it is. I see the numbers. I'm trying to solve them. And so I'm going to do that. And I have a lot of salt water in the big reservoir behind me. The one thing I'm going to have to do, I'm pretty sure, either I have to do this early in the morning before the lights come on, because that's when the tank will be at its coldest point, which will match the water in the reservoir, or I need to put some heaters in the reservoir, so that way the uh, salt water in there and the reef are about the same, so I can get away with what I'm trying to do. I will tell you, uh, when I added all that salt water to my sump last night, and then I turned off the return pump to feed the fish, I saw the water level much higher in the sump than I ever do. I mean, I still had about this much room across a huge sump, but it was weird to see the water level high. <laughs> it was almost as high as the top of the teeth of the refugium, which meant the plants could have migrated out. I mean, it wasn't that high. It was very close. It was about this far from the top. And it was just an odd thing to look at. It looked different. You know, you're used to seeing something exactly the same every single day. And the anemone cube, that back corner looks very pretty today. <laughs> so that worked. I even had to kind of rescue, like I told you, that walking dendro is in the way, which is a little tiny critter. It's a, a coral, it's a dendro, uh, dendrophilia coral that has a worm that lives inside the base and it crawls, well, it, the worm stretches out and pulls the coral to a new spot. And that's what it does. It just walks, and that's why it's called a walking dendro because this thing moves around your sand bed ever so slowly. You know, it's here, and then, you know, later in the day, it's over there, and you're like, how did it move? It's that worm. So anyway, that guy was in my way, and I was trying to avoid him, and then eventually I noticed, huh, I bumped him, I can't find him, and I had to reach in the sand and retrieve him as I was making such a mess. But, uh, yeah, so that was a, a good starting point. I'm going to keep doing that. I finished all the plumbing on the saltwater vat. I've got the new tubing on there. Um, what I did, and I'm going to, the video is going to explain this a little bit nicer, but I'll just update you. The uh, tubing that I got is kind of rigid, and I the 10-foot coil that I got wasn't long enough, as I explained. It just did, and I needed like 12 or 13 feet. So instead, I bought the next size up, which is 25 feet. And then I kept thinking, well, I want to make sure I have enough. I want to have a way to drain it. I, you know, Because when you close the valve, you still have water in the tube, and you don't want that water sitting in the tube until the next water change. So I was trying to think, what can I do to solve that? And then I realized I could just put a union where the tube connects right at the valve, and I can loosen the union a little bit to bleed in air and drain water out. So that was the first step. And then I realized, while I was at Home Depot, trying to work this out in my head mentally, that once the uh, union has been you know, installed, I actually have the ability to disconnect the tubing and just get it out of the way, because I don't need the tubing. And a lot of you had given me different suggestions. How can I hang up the tubing in a, in a safe way, and how can I secure it, and where should it go? And then I realized, you know, I can just get the right length of tubing, which I'll cut down from the 25 feet to whatever really needs to be used. I can connect it to the union, do the water change on either of the systems, and then when I'm done, I can disconnect it, drain it, and put it somewhere else for the next month. I don't need it in my way, or even sort of in my way, day in after day out. You know, I only need it when I need it, and it's always within reach. It just won't be connected to the actual circulation pump system until I actually have to run it. And the other thing I want to do is I want to put some kind of bracket to strengthen that bit of PVC pipe um, where the tubing connects, just so I don't pull on it and cause some problems. Because I would think the weakest point would probably be the connection at the top of the Vectra. <laughs> so if I can somehow make some kind of a wooden bracket that bolts to the wall and that pipe is being held really securely, then as I'm working, I won't put undue stress on the plumbing 
and po potentially have an, is an issue. You guys know I always like to make things where it'll last and where it'll hold up and where it won't fall apart. So I'm going to do that in this that situation as well. All right. Mina, thank you very much for the super chat. You are the first super chat of the day. And Glenn Smith, thank you very much for the super chat as well. Uh, he said, I've saved time and money because of your YouTube. <laughs> I'm glad. I mean, that's the whole point. Let's see. Andrea, thank you very much for putting all these links in the chat. I appreciate that. I'm sure that's helping others. Uh, Mr. Reefbuster says, how are your nitrates? And they're up. They're way up. I don't even know how they went up. They were like 30 for seven weeks, and then suddenly now they're measuring 60, 80. I don't know what's going on. I, it's really weird. So I'm glad I have a bunch of salt water. I can start just addressing this problem. And my friend Jason, who sent me that turf scrubber that I talked about last week and said where I'm going to put it, he sends me private messages on Facebook because he sees the updates. And he's like, you haven't installed that. And I'm like, I know. And he's like, you're killing me with your nitrates because he swears it's going to remove them. And I'm going to get that installed this week. I had to get the saltwater vat situation done. I'm going to do some water changes. I'm going to get that thing installed. I've um, been all week long. I've been focusing on customers and uh, I've been knocking stuff out. And uh, that's that. So... I just, I, that's, a, that's a project that'll take a few hours. It's got to build a stand. I've got to rig a sock to it. I mean, there's a bunch of things I have to do. And uh, so it's got to wait a little bit longer. Oh, Deal, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Let's see. Keith says, have you ever used ChemiClean before with a good outcome? I absolutely love ChemiClean. ChemiClean or Red Cyana RX, that's the one I sell. I think they're the exact same ingredient. They remove a... Uh, um, they remove cyanobacteria from your tank in about three to five days. And I have a very specific recommended method of dosing your tank. And if you follow it step by step exactly how I say it, it's going to work. And if you do it your own way or if you follow the instructions on the package and it doesn't work, you're going to have to go to my site and see exactly how I said to do it <laughs> and then try it again. But I love that product. When you have a cyano problem, you should solve it. And everyone, oh, I see it all the time. People will say, well, you need to know the underlying cause. You can't just throw a chemical at it. You can't, it's just a magic in a box. This is going to come back. I'm like, okay, cyanobacteria is absolutely 100% normal. And it happens in everything. It happens in freshwater, brackish water, salt water. And it actually is seasonal. It can appear in anyone's tank. It can happen in many people's tanks at the same time of year, too. It just happens. And when it blooms and it's red, that's when we complain. And it could be blue, it could be green, it could be red. So if you see it in your tank and you don't want to see it, you can remove as much as you can manually. What I would do is stop all the pumps and scoop it all together and then siphon that out or <clears throat> put it into a bowl and lift that out and dump it out. I'm always actively in the tank solving a problem rather than just trying to pour something at it. But once you've removed most of it, then you can treat the tank for what's left and in about three days, it should be completely gone. Now, keep in mind, cyanobacteria goes away every night and comes back every day. So if you put in the medicine and the next day you're looking at the tank, hey, look, it's all gone. No, it's not done. Because tomorrow you're going to see it again. <laughs> you need to look at it every single day and watch. And after three days, you're going to see that it's basically gone. At that point, you can do this huge water change and have more salt water ready because you're going to need it. And then get your protein skimmer running again. And the other thing is people are always like, oh, I leave my protein skimmer running with the cup off. Don't. Just turn off your skimmer. Take your skimmer and go clean it. Put it outside, run it in vinegar or citric acid, get it nice and clean. And that way when you're done with your ChemiClean treatment, put the skimmer in. It's brand new. It's maximum operation. And just start processing the water. And that skimmer is going to pull out so much watery liquid. It won't look like skim mate. It's going to look like water. You're like, ah, what's wrong with this tank? Why won't the skimmer settle down? Keep throwing that water away and all that extra salt water I told you to make, keep putting that in the tank to replace what you're losing from the skimmer until the skimmer settles down. That might take six hours. It just is what it is. And now, within three to five days and a few hours of hassle with the protein skimmer, your tank is back to normal and there's no cyanobacteria. And if you have to do that once or twice a year, I don't consider that cheating. I don't consider that a problem. I consider that it's just part of doing business. <laughs> it's just part of our hobby and sometimes you have to deal with it. And so if you deal with it once or twice a year, who cares? Just do it and solve it. All right.
Uh, B Fortune says, I use an algae scrubber for nitrate and phosphate export. Is there any benefit seeding it with some sort of macro? Do some algae absorb more or less nutrients? Okay, well, the turf scrubber thing is kind of new to me. I mean, I've been aware of it for a long time, but I've not had hands-on experience. But when Jason was telling me about this one that I'm going to be installing from Foursquare Aquatics, he actually told me to seed the screen. So I actually get some algae off someone else's turf scrubber. Got to find someone. <laughs> and then rub that on the screen and put that in to seed the turf scrubber. But if you already have one and it's doing something, because you said it, you're using it to control nitrate and phosphate, you shouldn't really need to seed it because it's going. But if, it, if nothing's growing on it you need to put something on it, then get some from someone else and rub it all over there. Um, I would assume you're going to be looking for something that re resembles hair algae, mostly, um, because that's probably going to be the most abundant grower inside the turf scrubber. Also, and this one I'll need to check with others, um, you may... It might be worth considering not running the lights on it 24 hours a day, especially if it's super effective. If it's so effective it's pulling everything out of the water and things are starting to turn pale, maybe reduce the lighting in there so it's only... Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. This is total guesswork in my head, you know, and it's one of the things I don't know I need to find out. But maybe by running less light on it, it's pulling out some, but it's not stripping the tank clean. Uh, but I'm being told that it's going to remove my nitrate. So that's why you'd think by now it had hooked up, but I just, I had to have a spot to put it. I had to have salt water. I had, things have to happen in a certain order. Simon, uh, I, you're not, <laughs> you're not doing anything wrong. He says, sorry, this isn't particularly relevant, but actually I love it. He said, but I wanted to just say, you know, a huge thank you for uploading so much of your hard-won knowledge. Uh, you've made a big difference for me starting out. And see, that's the whole point. All of us start out. Everyone has starts with a glass box, and we want to make it into something pretty. And so by giving you the knowledge that I can to help you avoid some of the pitfalls uh, should helpful, hopefully make it go so well that you can just enjoy yourself with the majority of the hobby and not be frustrated. Because when you're being frustrated and you're not getting straight answers from people, and you go to the fish store and they just keep telling you try this and try that and try this and try that and you just feel like you're just in this loop of death <laughs> and destruction, it's really frustrating. So that's why I have a website full of information and that's why I've been doing the YouTube thing for a few years now. Uh, Trevor says, do you think high magnesium can help with hair algae and if so, can you explain why? Please keep up the great work. Um, if you, there was a product years ago by Kent called Tech M, T E C H M, and it was a magnesium additive. And someone found out that by using Kent Tech M in your tank in excessive amounts would make bryopsis die. Not hair algae, but bryopsis. Bryopsis is a different type of algae. It's also green, it looks hairy, but it looks feathery. You know, if you look at it really closely under magnifying glass, it's not just hairs, it's more like ferns off of each branch. And it's very coarse. And when you're trying to remove that, it's hard to pluck off the rock. It's so coarse. And using a lot of Kent Tech M to get your magnesium measuring around 1800 for a few weeks would kill off the bryopsis. But it also had a hard effect on your snails. All your snails would stop moving because their muscles in their foot would atrophy and they're stuck. And if they stay like that too long, they'll die because they can't move, they can't eat. And uh, that's the end of that. So there was the downside. Some people would remove their snails from the tank while they're doing Kent Tech M. Uh, others would just use magnesium. Like, well, I'll just raise my magnesium. That didn't work. There was something in the Tech M that no one knew that was a magic ingredient. <laughs> I don't know if it was New York water. Um, I don't know if it was a drop of iodine. I have no idea what it was, but something about that product would kill Baropsis. And then Kent, uh, Jack Kent, who owned Kent, uh, products no longer work for the company. He owned it and he sold it or whatever and now he runs Continuum and Continuum has some version of the Tech M. I think they even call it Bryopsis something. So in theory you should be able to get that from Continuum. But the uh, Flux RX or the Fluconazole will also work in Bryopsis and you don't have to touch the magnesium. You don't have to make your snail stop moving. So uh, I would just kind of stay with, uh, I wouldn't use magnesium to raise it up. I w when I had bryopsis in my tank, it came from a guy who says, can you hold some corals for me, Mark? I'm moving to another state. And I said, where am I going to put them? 
And he says, I'm going to bring you a bunch of live rock too. <laughs> so he came over and we looked at my tank and we agreed, I'm going to move this, pull this out, make space, put your rock in here, put your corals all over it. And then, you know, like in about eight weeks or 12 weeks, I was going to ship him all of his corals. And, uh, we even changed my lighting the way I did it. And he was the guy that inspired me to use, um, different metal halide bulbs than what I had on my tank. I had a, I think I had three 250s, uh, 250 watt bulbs. And he told me you should put a 420 K right in the middle of your reef. And I was like, what? And he brought over a ballast and we hooked it up and it looked really cool. And I went with that for many years. And so it was 250, 10 K, 420 K, 250, 10 K. And it looked like the sun was shining down the middle of my reef. It was really amazing. And it was great. And, uh, so anyway, Got these corals, got that rock, and suddenly I had this bryopsis problem I'd never had before in my life. And I was like, what is the deal? And I reached out to the guy and I said, you know, so, uh, I suddenly have bryopsis, I think it's your fault. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, my fox face eats it. And I said, I don't have a fox face. And he's like, oh, well, I did in my tank, and now that there's no fox face, I guess that's why you have bryopsis. I'm like, gee, thanks. So I, um, had to deal with the problem. Now, one of the things that will eat bryopsis is something called a lettuce nudibranch. They're absolutely beautiful. They're going to be in my, uh, probably in the, well, it's in Critter ID. It's probably in the worm section, potentially. Um, I'm redesigning my website, and I'm going to have more categories to spread things out a little bit more evenly to make it easier to find things on my uh, Critter ID section. But um, it's going to be a couple of months till that's finished. But the uh, thing is, the lettuce nudibranch, super fluffy, has no weight whatsoever. I mean, it's like putting a feather in your tank, and it just wants to blow everywhere. And you basically hold it on the bryopsis, and it starts eating it. And then the next day, you go look for it, and it's stuck to a power head. And you peel it off the power head, and you go put it back on the bryopsis, and it starts eating more. And then the next day, you find it down in your refugium, and you take it out of the refugium, you go up to the reef, and you're trying to hold it, and it's trying to float away, and you're like trying to use your fingers like a cage to place it on the bryopsis, and it eats some more. So lettuce nudibranchs would work. And then the other thing was to actually lower the water level in the tank and put peroxide right on the bryopsis. But I prefer to remove the rock out of the tank and do it over the sink so that way you're not putting a bunch of peroxide into your tank, even contact-wise. I like to just rinse that rock in some tank water and then put it back in the tank. If you use a little too much peroxide in your tank, what you'll actually observe happen, all the snails on your, on your glass will start going up the walls as fast as they can to the surface. It's really funny. So uh, rather than doing that to your snails, I, I try to do uh, any peroxide work away from the tank over the sink. Uh, another thing about, should have said this during the big long section, but bryopsis is, because it's so coarse, what it does is it puts, um, it gathers detritus in those feathery fronds and pulls it down and creates its own little sand bed right there in the rock work. So when you have an algae problem in your tank, one of the best things you can do is you can go through with a power head, like a Maxi Jet or a Nero 5, those have a super long cord, and you can just blast all your rock work, just you know, hit it from every angle, and all this detritus will come loose, and you're actually flushing the detritus out of the bryopsis, and now it's just bare plants attached to rock, but it can't fuel itself off of the food that it was absorbing from the little nutrient-rich sand bed it was creating around its base. So you blast out every last bit of crud from within the algae itself, where it's attached to the rock, and that will help starve it as well. So if you can do that, then it'll weaken, and again, it's you're still going to not get all of it because it's so coarse, but you're going to rip off what you can rip off with your fingertips into a bowl of water, rinse your fingers, put your hand in, do it again, and then you're going to put in uh, your cleanup crew to get the last of it. And if you can get lettuce nudibranchs, they're great. But again, once the food is gone, they're going to go too. So you have to find a home for them as well. And I did not mention this before, and I didn't intend to. I don't recommend scrubbing the rock. I, I hate when people do that because it never solves anything. They all feel better for them. You know, they're like, oh, I scrubbed it. And the thing is, they a few months later or a few weeks later, there's algae again. They're like, what happened? I scrubbed it all off. It's not a scrubbable thing. You pick it off. You pinch it off. You remove it and then you let your cleanup crew eat it. If you scrub, two things will happen. It will spread the fibers everywhere else. It'll spread it all over into your tank, or if you're doing this outside, in, you know, over a barrel of salt water or something like that, and you're scrubbing the rock off, it's gonna send the tendrils everywhere, and even as you rinse the rock, there's tendrils still on the rock. It, the rock's not clean. There's little bits of algae still on it, and then you put it back in your tank, 
and whatever loose stuff is floating around will land on the rock and grow again. And the other thing is when you're scrubbing and you're rubbing your brush across the rock, you're just like a, a toothbrush going across paint. It spatters and it aerosolizes it and you can actually inhale stuff. And if you're scrubbing rock that has zoanthids on it or palithoa, as you're scrubbing off algae, you might be sending palytoxin into the air that you're inhaling, even though you're outside, and you could start getting sick. So I don't recommend scrubbing rock ever. <laughs> Not for anything. I've never scrubbed rock. I don't recommend it. Don't pressure wash it. Don't use a propane torch. Just pick it off. Add the clamp crew. All right. Uh, Crisis Film says, we notice you offer 100 gallon a day and 150 gallon a day RODI systems. Have you considered offering a 50 gallon a day for us with smaller systems? No. Um, and when you say smaller systems, my first RODI system that I bought back in 2002 was 100 gallons a day. And I had a 29 gallon aquarium. The reason I got the 100 gallon a day system back then, and this is the exact system I sell to this day, that company stopped working. I took over their business and I've been selling them. It makes four gallons an hour. And when you have a small system and you're making, if you have a 50 gallon a day system, uh, RODI system, that means you're going to make two gallons an hour on a good day. And in the winter, you might make a gallon an hour. <laughs> so do you really want to wait five or six hours to fill up a bucket of water? It's just too long. So I want to make my four, you know, when I was doing water changes on my 29 gallon, I was changing five to 10 gallons at a time. I could make that in about two hours. And then, you know, I didn't use the system for a few weeks. And then later on, I was like, you know, I'm gonna make drinking water too. And so I started using it a little bit more frequently. And of course I had to make top off water, but that tank only evaporated half a gallon a day. So I just needed two five gallon jugs to collect RODI water in. And then I would pour one jug into my top off container and that took care of the tank for a week. And then, you know, I had to do a water change, I had my other jug, and I'd dump that into a bucket, add the salt, add the heater, add the power head, let it sit and run for a day or two. And I did my five gallon water change on my 29 gallon system. But having 100 gallons a day is gonna get you four gallons an hour. It's really 4.16 gallons an hour. And there's just no reason to make you wait even longer. A lot of the drinking water systems you see at Home Depot or Costco or Sam's, they're like 35 gallons a day, super slow but they're made for drinking water, and that's because they only have to make three gallons of water for a bladder tank that's under the sink. We use a lot more water than that, even with a small tank. You got your water change, you got your top off, and then if you happen to branch off for drinking water, you're gonna use some water. So having the 100 gallon a day is what I recommend, even for someone with a small tank. I already answered that, somebody jumped ahead of me. Oh yeah, that's a good one. So I've never done this, so I didn't talk about it. Um, some people use mollies to control algae in their tank. And molly is a freshwater fish that can uh, be adapted or migrated over to saltwater. They're, well, I, I guess they're more of a brackish fish. And then they can be, go into saltwater and they can live there. And I've seen some mollies in some tanks, but it's not like I see a molly in every saltwater tank. So some people do it. Um, nothing wrong with that. It can be part of your cleanup crew. Yep. Thanks for reminding me. Answered that already. I must have done a good job with my talk. Um, Mark D says, I have a 160 gallon tank. Which would be better for the tank, the Abyss A100 or the A200? Well, I have a 400 gallon right behind me and that's got the A200. So I would think the A100 would be more than enough for your tank. Michael says, why no videos on dinoflagellates? because I don't have a great solution to the problem and I haven't had a full-blown situation. I have only had hints of it, so I've talked about what little bits I had to do to solve it, but uh, I just don't have the hands-on knowledge to really give a good educational video on this topic, but I'm sure others have. Uh, Adam says, what about diatoms? Do you have any tricks for that up your sleeve? Uh, diatoms are normal. They are temporary in your tank, they are food for the bacteria, and they will fade away in a matter of weeks. So we don't try to solve that, that's completely what we want to happen in our tank. We want the diatom bloom, because then boom, you're gonna have more bacteria in there. Tim B says, what do you think about Neptune Systems finally making some lights? Pretty cool, eh? Uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing them. I'm very curious to know what exactly we're, you know, we're being offered. 
the uh, new series apparently is going to be called Sky. And uh, I read a good article from Mar Marson Smoke over on Reefs.com where he gave, he gave everyone the big reveal. And uh, so obviously there's something in the works that will obviously be Apex friendly. So if you have an Apex controller, you'll be able to use that light and control it with your app. So that'd be exciting. Um, we'll have to see what the price point is, how they do, what they look like, what are they like? Are they like the Philips uh, light that Terrence loves so much? I'm very curious what we're actually going to see. But yeah, that's a, we don't even know when we're going to see it. <laughs> but uh, it's something in the works, so that's kind of neat. Uh, Michael says, I'd like to set up a 60-gallon bubble tip anemone cube with a pair of Clarky clowns. Would you go fishless and add the BTAs, the bubble tip anemones, to establish first and then add the clowns? I heard they can be rough with anemones. Uh, yeah, they actually are. They're probably one of the more meaner clownfish. Clarkies and uh, maroon clowns are both bullies. They're just mean. They could bite you. Um, and do you really want a tank full of bubble tip anemones and two clowns? It just sounds so boring to me. I mean, I don't know. I guess it could work. Um, I like that I have a bunch of clownfish in my anemone cube. And... Uh, I shared a video recently where I showed them all coming out because no one ever sees them. All they see is the tentacles. <laughs> and there's like one clown in the picture. And so I, when I feed every night, I get to see them all. And there's about 11 or 12 clowns in that tank. And they're always doing something, but it's for like a heartbeat. You just like, you see the orange one. She's always circling the tank because she's the mom. And uh, she's always checking on everyone. And you'll see little tiny ones, itty bitty little guys. They've been in there for years and they're still tiny because the way it works with clownfish, there's a hierarchy. The biggest one's the female, the next biggest is a male, and then everything else is its. And in that tank over there, the anemone cube has the female, and I'm surprised that we don't have a little bit more infighting, because some of the other ones are pretty big, and you'd almost think there'd be multiple males at this point, or possibly a potential new female. And usually the way it works in, in uh, the ocean is the female lives until she dies, and when she dies, the male becomes a female, and the next one becomes a male, and the continuation of all the smaller clownfish, all the way down to the tiniest. So that's how it is in nature, and uh, that's how it works in our tanks as well. So in this tank, I haven't seen any fighting. I only saw breeding one time. I've only, you know, when I say that, I've seen eggs one time. I haven't seen them since. I don't know if she hides them somewhere better. I just never see them. But uh, I like the activity of many, and just having a pair in a 60-gallon tank with a bunch of anemones might be kind of boring for you. So perhaps uh, if you want to do a bunch of clowns, I don't recommend you mix it with a bunch of your favorite flavors. That is something that people have made that mistake. And a lot of people say, but BRS did it! And I've talked with Ryan at BRS, and he said that was the most difficult tank ever, and they had to constantly remove clownfish from it because it was not working out. So if you want to successfully put a bunch of clownfish in one tank to live together as a group, they all have to come from the same breeder's clutch of eggs. So if they have a tank full of six-month-old clownfish, all from one mom and dad, <laughs> you're wanting all of those clowns at once. So you're like, give me 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, whatever you're going with. I mean, I did 20. Um, or I did 18. But uh, you want to get as many of the biggest ones they have. So if you can get like, for example, you're copying me exactly, you get 18 one inch clownfish from the same clutch of eggs and you put them all in the tank at once and they will swim in a ball just like they did in the breeder's tank. And then they will finally migrate into the anemones. And then you may see some squabbling over time. I had to pull a few out, one jumped and died. I pulled a few out and I put them into the frag tank. I had one more get attacked, and I put it down in my refugium for a long time. And then when I replaced the sump, I reintroduced that clown back into the tank, and they accepted it, which shocked me. I didn't think that was going to happen. So all those clowns have been getting along. There's no territorial squabbles. I still see little ones dart out of the enemies to get a bite of food and retreat quickly when the big ones all start, you know, showing up. But uh, having one group all from the same clutch of eggs is the successful way to have a bunch. And even then, that's not forever. I've had these for probably four years. And uh, my friend Matt Peterson, who is a clownfish breeder, says, you'll be okay for a couple of years. So the fact that I've doubled my time successfully, I'm happy with. 
and the three in the frag tank, they'll stay there. They're fine over there. Uh, Tim says, I'm curious why you like Prodibio so much. How do you feel it benefits your reef for the cost and slightly annoying need to snap open vials? Um, I like it because it works and uh, the I don't find it difficult to use. You know, you put it in my tank twice a month. I need to do it actually uh, in a couple days. And uh, I put in four vials every every 15 days and uh, it the corals are colorful. I don't have any weird issues. Um, there's a bacteria in there. There's a there's an antibacteria in the other one, the BioDigest, that helps consume waste. And uh, there's iodine that I use, and there's strontium that I use. And I've been doing it since 2011. I don't know, I just like it. Uh, I've never had a problem with it. I've never seen anything bad. My tank's rocking and it's pretty. So uh, that's why I like using it. And the annoying part of snapping it seems pretty simple to me. I mean, sure, you can have a bottle and you can open the cap, but each vial is designed for a certain amount of water, so you don't have to even measure it out. You don't have to dose it. You can just break it, pour it in, done. I like it. Um, Mike says, I have a 36 liter tank with two AI primes for coverage. Any issues with one side being less bright for low demanding corals than the other side? Visually, it might bug you. Uh, if you see, there's a couple things you can do. Um, you might think, well, this side always looks really bright and this side looks dim. And that might bother you just aesthetically. Uh, you might actually take the light that needs less and raise it up slightly higher. <laughs> but now the lights are uneven, so that might bother you. Um, you could raise both of them up and then turn the intensity up of the one and maybe it'll kind of seem more similar to that naked eye. You know, and just if you used a par meter, you could actually measure what's happening. But low light demanding corals, they are going to be low in the tank anyway. We rarely put low demanding corals up high. So it also comes down to placement. So if your lights are over the tank and the tank is this wide, you can put low light corals down low and on the ends of the tank rather than directly under the lights. So they're getting some of the cursory light rather than the intense light directly under the fixture itself. But there's no other issues. Like I said, it's all aesthetics. Wow, we have 348 people on here right now. Uh, Hal says, I'm just going to go with that. <laughs> when do you decide that the cleanup crew isn't enough and you should use something like fluc uh, fluconazole? Well, if you have a bunch of algae growing out of your rock, that's, <laughs> that's a pretty good sign that something needs to change. Whether you need to use medication like fluconazole or you have to add a cleanup crew to start devouring it or you have to reach in with your arm and start picking it off, those are your choices. But you're going to want to stay on top of it before it gets out of control. And I think that's the biggest problem when it comes to algae control is that people will leave the situation um, untouched for too long and it gets worse and worse and worse. And you're thinking, well, I really need to deal with that, but you say, I'll do it tomorrow. I'm gonna do it this weekend. I got too much going on right now. And we let it get even worse. <laughs> and it gets to that point where it's like, oh my God, it's such a, this is gonna be such a job. I don't have time for that. I'll do it next weekend. And you know, basically the entire tank is just going downhill because we just let it spiral out of control. So you said, when should we do it? Like I said, if you replace cleanup crew twice a year, you'll probably stay on top of things. And uh, I know some people just buy them and they just forget about it. They don't remember when they bought it. If you're using the Reef Trace app, you can actually put in the notes when you buy things, like Cleanup Crew, and you can put in notes when you added them to your tank. And that way you can review your notes and see when you did it. Or you can set a reminder that says, you know, six months from now, hey, get a new Cleanup Crew. <laughs> Bing, you wake up, you look at your phone, and there's this message. So that is something you can keep in mind. I'm going to have to find my phone at some point. I don't even know where it is. because I want to show you guys something. Oh, there it is, okay. Uh, Nick Walter says, I have a big bag of Carib Sea live sand that has died out in the, dried out in the bag, <laughs> not died. And is it still good to use? Uh, how did it dry out? Was the bag cut open and then you resealed it? Or did it just dry out being unused sitting on the shelf or in the garage too long? Uh, I think that kind of matters. There is stuff in there that will activate once it gets oxygen. So 
I mean, honestly, if it really did dry out and just everything died, you're just adding sand to, sand to the tank without the benefit of life. There's a chance that some of the stuff deep down within the sand, just like when, you re when you're digging in the ocean, when you're digging in the beach near the ocean, as you get lower down, it's more moist. It could be it's moist still in the core of that bag and you might still have some life in there. So there could be some beneficial, but maybe it's not perfect like it would have been with a brand new bag. Uh, Michael says, I was thinking about using one fish to perfectly live in my quarantine, such as a cleaner ras. Would this be a good idea? I use copper in my quarantine. Would this be a problem for the ras? Wow, I don't know. Um, it's very important to know what fish can tolerate copper. I would keep the quarantine tank running um, because it's always nice to have one ready in case you come home with a new fish. But I wouldn't keep a fish in there permanently. I Let's just pretend for a second that you're... I mean, I don't know the answer. I'm not a fish disease guy, but I'm just working my way through it mentally. If you have a quarantine tank with this cleaner wrasse, and let's say you got a brand new flame angel, and you're treating with copper, and then after, I don't know, three weeks or so, whatever the duration is, like I said, I know nothing. And let's say the duration was a week, two weeks, three weeks, and now you're changing the water and you're removing the copper from the system, so now it's copper free. We know that copper gets into the silicone, which is why we never use a tank that's had copper in it for a reef tank. I don't know how long-term that RAS would do in a tank that gets copper, loses copper, gets copper, loses copper. I, I just don't know. I could see resetting the tank from time to time. It might even be good to dry out a tank if you're really not going to use it for a while and clean it with bleach and just make it like pristine like you do a hospital room and now you start with new salt water and some bacteria and uh, you hang on your hang on back filter, you put in your heater. I just don't like the idea of putting a fish in there um, long term that's going through copper after copper after copper. I don't know. I, it sounds like a bad idea, but I'm not a fish disease person. But I wouldn't leave any fish in a quarantine tank forever anyway, so. Uh, Rob's Reef says, can I also get a false test reading in RODI water for nitrites like you can with phosphates? I don't know. <laughs> I've never tested an RODI for uh, nitrate. Nitrite. So I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, Igranitas says, I've been dealing with green turf algae for seven months now. It's not growing out of control. Just a few tiny patches throughout the tank. I take it out, it grows back, and never never gets any bigger. Help! Uh, I would say go back to the beginning of this live stream and watch the first 45 minutes, because I talked all about that. Um, Michael says, can I use phosphate Rx in a doser mixed with RO water? No. I'm going to say no, just don't do it. Just use it the way you're supposed to use it. Follow the directions. It works great. Um, looking for more questions addressed to me. Alex says, are you still using bio pellets to control nutrients? I haven't run bio pellets in years. Dashcam says, my tank is 12 months old. I am dosing phosphate Rx, but my phosphates keep rising. Uh, I've got GHA or green hair algae and I've got red algae. Could you advise me anything I can do? Um, we got to figure out where it's coming from. Uh, like I was telling you, there's this guy up in Canada that's been really battling with phosphate and trying to figure it out. And it turns out he's feeding his tank three times a day and he has five tangs. And that would tell me where all the phosphate's coming from. <laughs> I mean, I have five tangs in my tank. So that explains where my phosphates are coming from. Uh, we're feeding these fish. These fish are pooping and they're raising phosphate and we have to remove it. So ideally, we want to get the phosphate down and keep it down. So if you have to use phosphate RX, because you already own it, if you have to use it like every other day for a couple of weeks to get them down and keep them down, just do that. And then they should stay down, you know, at a reasonable level. And then you're dosing it sporadically. Where uh, my friend Tammy has, has a huge reef that she was dosing 100 drops of phosphate RX to her tank every single week like maintenance. That was her routine. She swore by it. And she was connecting a couple of sheets of nori to two different PVC apparatuses that she'd lower in the tank for all of her fish to chew on. And uh, I was like, wow. 
And so that was a lot of fossil. There was a lot of huge fish, and she was feeding the hell out of those things. So uh, she just used it as a maintenance dose every single week. That was her routine. But uh, usually, once you get it down, it stays down. My tank is just so old that I feel like I'm kind of losing the battle. And uh, it's not old tank syndrome. It's just it's, it's had a lot of things happen in it in the last six and a half years. And so now that's why I'm wanting to start siphoning out my sand bed uh, to remove the detritus. I don't want to remove the sand bed. I want to remove the detritus. And I also want to get some more sand. I was just on Premium Aquatics website last night looking at buying live sand from them. And I want to call them on Monday when they're open and talk to them about uh, getting, I don't know, six bags of live sand from them, the Tropic Eden kind that I like, and put that in my tank and bring my sand bed up. Because see how low it is here? I want to bring it back up to where it was, you know, about four. Well, I can't go too high because of this coral. <laughs> but all the other ones that are down low that are sitting on the sand, they can be up higher. But yeah, my tank is low on sand. I want to get more in there. Sixty nine Camaro. I've never used Vibrant, so I can't answer that. I mentioned that in the beginning of this uh, presentation. Uh, Rob says, "How do you know when to change the carbon block on the RODI? It's been over a year, and I still get zero TDS." Okay, so this is a big misnomer. People keep measuring the TDS and associating it with the sediments and the carbon filters. These three filters, or if your system only has two filters. They are protecting the membrane. They don't remove any TDS. They, that's not their job. They don't do anything but protect the membrane from damage from chlorine and ammonia and sediment and trace metals and elements and fluoride and, you know, whatever the city puts in the water or what comes out of your well, this protects the membrane. The membrane's removing everything. You have to change your carbon blocks every six months and your sediment because they are protecting the membrane. And when you change those out, more water can flow through them because they're not clogged up. They're not used up. Uh, I noticed many years ago, after six months, I removed my uh, middle housing, and that was the first carbon block, and I pulled it out, and it smelled like a swimming pool. I could just smell the chlorine coming off of it. It was amazing. And I, I felt really good. So I took out the second one, and it, it barely smelled of chlorine. I was like, okay, good. And, but the general rule of thumb that I've come up with, mathematically, is if you make 125 gallons of water a month, and that's going to be top off water and water change water, then you those filters are good for six months. So that's the easiest way to do the math. So if you're only making you know 50 gallons a month, yeah, they probably will last a year. But they, I just I highly recommend you change your filters every six months, just like clockwork. Just do it, just like we change the air filter on our air conditioner in the house. Uh, you have to do that. Some of them you have to do every single month. I actually have a a system that uses six-month filters, and I replace them every six months as well. And mine are dated from July, so actually mine are going to be replaced. That's why you saw them. I'm going to change out mine today. But the the sediment, I mean, the uh, membrane pulls out the majority, 98% of the TDS, uh, 93 to 98%, depends on the membrane. And then the DI polish is the last of it. That's why you're getting zero still. The membrane's still doing its job. But the other filters are protecting that membrane, and once the membrane goes, you got to replace the membrane. So that's why we change our carbons and sediments frequently. Um, Big Proper says, hang on, let me look at your uh, badge. Emergency service. Okay. Um, I have a Marineland Pro 48-inch light with four T5 actinic bulbs and two 150-watt HQI 12K metal halide bulbs on a 125-gallon tank. And it's eight inches above the water. Am I burning corals while only running it one hour a day? No. Uh, an hour a day shouldn't be a problem at all. You're going to want longer, obviously, at some point, right? What do you... Um, you might have to follow up with that with some more information, but there's a reason why you're only going one hour right now. But eventually, you're going to be going up to probably seven or nine hours a day, correct? And if you're... Uh, your light being eight inches of the water is okay. Um, general rule of thumb with metal halides was 9 inches to 12 inches off the water, so you're a little bit closer, but one hour won't do anything bad to your corals, even the ones up high. Sharon says, do you think the sand bed should only be 1 inch rather than 3 or 4? The 4 inch sand bed, really 4 to 6 inches, is what's called the deep sand bed, or DSB, and that is what a lot of us did back in the day, and I still kind of embrace it. You know, this tank has easily 4 inches of sand in it, except where it's being blown up by the Vortec. 
um, under the rock work, it's <laughs> this deep. The, um, the anemone cube has sand about this tall. Some people just have this much sand, just a half an inch or an inch. And it's more for aesthetics rather than for any kind of benefit to the tank, even though any kind of sand is still better than no sand. And the reason I say that is because with some sand, you get the light reflecting off the sand and hitting the underside of the corals with some light. You have a spot for bacteria and bugs to live and breed and worms to crawl through. And when there's no sand, I mean, you just end up with a tank that always seems to have some detritus you have to look at and remove. So I like to have sand in a tank, and I do like a deep sand bed, but it also comes down to what you're willing to look at. For example, if my tank had uh, this much sand in it, so like let's say we had from down here to here about five inches of sand, and I didn't like the look, I could put woodwork across the front that hides most of it. And that way I would only see like the top inch of sand and the rest would be buried down behind the woodwork and be out of sight. But uh, if you're trying to have something special, like um, let's say wrasses, they like to sleep in a sand bed, so deeper sand beds can be better for the wrasse to get down in there, versus a shallow sand bed, it tries to dive under and it hits glass or it hits acrylic, so that's not deep enough. And uh, what was another thing I was thinking of that needs to be in the sand? Um, even sand conks like to submerge themselves in the sand and, and kind of hibernate for a few weeks while they grow their shell a little bit bigger, I believe. So having more sand in the tank is usually better than less. <laughs> but some people don't want sand at all because they want to have maximum flow and they, they just want to blow the polyps right off the corals. And so they can't have sand because it'll just go everywhere. Uh, so like I said, it comes down to a preference, what you'd like to look at. Um... William says, should I get more cleanup crew the same size as the crew in the tank? In other words, are you doubling what you have? Actually, you'll probably get quite a bit more than what's in your tank, because usually what's still in your tank are leftovers. They're the, the survivors. Um, you might have a dozen things that have lived, you know, and it's been a year, it's been two years since you've got any cleanup crew. You probably need to add like 50, 60, 70 items. And so you're going to load up. You're going to put in 25 snails. You're going to put in 20 hermit crabs. You're going to... You're going to add a couple of urchins and a, and a cucumber and a conch and, you know, 10 nasarius. And see, that's, I think I just rattled off something like 60 right there. It's really easy to get a bunch of stuff. Uh, William, or Alan says, will peroxide kill the bacteria in the rock? Yeah, so, <laughs> yes. I mean, it's designed to get rid of bacteria. So when you're trying to solve algae and you're trickling it with a pipette, like I was saying here, or a uh, syringe, and you're just... Drib you're dribbling it all over the rock, some of it's going to run down and it's going to drip into the sink. So there may be a trail where it's... But we're not like submerging the entire rock in peroxide. Some people have taken frags that are on a frag plug and they filled the bowl with peroxide or peroxide and water, like 50-50, with half tank water, half peroxide, and they hold the plug in the water and they turn the frag to basically kill off everything on the frag plug and then they put the coral in their tank uh, with this... Uh, hygienic frag plug. <laughs> so that is a method that can work to kill things off. Other people are just so adamant not to take a risk, they will break the coral off the frag plug, throw the frag plug away, and plant the coral in the reef directly to avoid any kind of algae coming from where the, the source of the coral came from. Uh, Daryl says, I'm in a losing battle with nitrates, running bio pellets in a reactor. It's been 10 weeks with no reduction as of yet. What would you suggest? Also, I've been adding MB7. Yeah, you want to add MB7 once a week. You want to make sure you have enough bio pellets in the system, in the reactor, that matches the size of your tank. Um, it isn't a quick process. It, what are your nitrates now? What's going on? Um, Carl says, when would you recommend adding SPS corals to a reef tank? The rock is seven years old, but recently moved into a new tank after you know, using all this rock. I've been keeping SPS for five years plus. If the tank is stable and everything is uh, trustworthy and uh, running well, you can start introducing SPS. Um, SPS just need perfect parameters. You know this. You've got five years experience. You can definitely use your rock, put it in your new tank, and, you know, I would say within a matter of weeks, you could probably introduce your corals without too much trouble. Probably, number one, because you've got the experience already with the coral, so you know what to look for. And secondarily, you know what to look at with a new tank to see how it's doing. If the rock has been exposed to a lot of air during the process of transitioning to the new tank, 
to where the water has to cycle. You might have to wait for the cycle to complete first and then go ahead and move all your SPS in there. But, uh, you know, when I did this tank, all the corals were in a separate tank. And then I had this tank running for about a month with the rock I had for the foundation. And after a solid month, and I even skimmed the tank like the day before, I then tied it in so that everything shared the same sump uh, for a few hours. So everything had the exact same water. Started moving corals and rock into this tank and filled it up with what was, you know, what livestock I had. And there was a lot of SPS in there. But uh, yeah, stability. You know that. Stability promotes success, SPS. So that would be my suggestion there. Uh, Jared says, what's going on with Prodibio? Why are they absent from most vendors? I don't know. Um, I'm actually, <laughs> I just haven't done it. I'm going to be selling it. Uh, I just read someone else. I think Algae Barn is going to sell it. Um, my Elos supplier is selling the Prodibio now, and I think it was just a matter of getting into the country possibly. But uh, So it'll be on my website soon. Sorry, I haven't had time to add it yet, but it's coming. Um, in the meantime, you can always send me a message to tell me what you're looking for specifically, what size, how many. That helps me a lot because it's been guesswork. What kind of inventory should I even get? You know, I don't want to just get a wall of Prodibio and then you guys are only buying such and such and I have a thousand dollars worth of Prodibio nobody wants. You know, I need to get the right stuff. So contact me, please. Michael says, I just got home and there's a package from you on the porch. I didn't even leave the camera. How the heck did that happen so quickly? Uh, 508 says, I've, I'm getting cyano in my sump. Are there any ideas? Yeah, you can just remove it. If it's down in your sump, uh, sometimes it happens in my refugium. And I'll take a credit card and I'll start scraping the glass and peel off any red cyan that bothers me. And you can even use a fishnet to kind of like catch all the, the flakes of cyano and just remove it. If you're doing a water change, you can siphon it out. Um, if you want to use the vacuum attachment on a maxi jet and pump it out, you can work your way over the cyano and just pump it right into a, a handy sock or something and eliminate it that way. But uh, odds are there's some kind of light down in your sump, like over the refugium zone, or light from the room is getting in there and it's causing some of the cyano to grow down there. Uh, and it can be removed. Just because it's growing in the sump doesn't mean it's going to show up in your tank. It might just do fine down in the sump. But if it's just bothering you, just clean it out. Nordic Blue says, I had a tank crash in December and ended up with hair algae everywhere. I went with your advice of just big water changes, manually removing as much as I could and cleaning everything down. Yeah. I'm sorry you went through a crash. Can you tell us what happened? What caused the crash? Lamont, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Dan says, can you use GFO in a reactor and vodka dose? I would say yes. Because the vodka dosing is for nitrate and the GFO is for phosphate. Uh, Insane Reefer says, my cycle is almost done. I'm not planning on getting first, I think he means fish, just yet. Will the bacteria die if I don't add ammonia? Uh, if your cycle is complete, what you could do for now until you're getting any kind of fish don't run the lights, you just don't need them. And you could put in some flake food once or twice a week just to kind of keep the bacteria fed. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Michael Harvey just got, he asked me to make him a specific feeder chimney for his auto feeder and I had to make something that was going to fit on a tank in a way I never make. <laughs> so he just said that it worked and it looks great and he's sent pictures. Thank you. I really want to see how it worked. Basically I'd call it a prototype. We just made something that he asked for and I want to see how it's going to work, what I have to change for if I have to make it ever again. Um, I literally make these things. I have one left here in stock that's for a customer. Uh, so this has got protective paper on here. I'll just pull it off. So the auto feeder chimney, I came up with this a long time ago um, because I didn't like the food to hit the water and go straight down the drain of the tank. 
you know, go down in the overflow and, and into the sump. It was a waste of food. So instead, you have your water coming to here, and then this part is above the water, obviously, this, this section, and the auto feeder sitting here and drops food. And it drops in, it gets wet, and then the food comes out the bottom. So I have one right here on my tank, and it's been there for years, and I take it off once in a while to clean. And uh, it's designed to sit on the overflow box. <laughs> that's the perfect spot. You'd think there's no way you could put it there because that's the overflow box and the food would get wasted. But the food comes down and goes into the reef and the water flows past this and goes to the overflow teeth. So it doesn't, you don't lose food. It's really neat. And if you don't have a cover on your overflow box, I make overflow cover lids. So I make you a lid that fits in your overflow and then you can put this right on top, put your auto feeder on top, drop the food in and it just, it works out really well because the height is perfect for the length of the chimney section and uh, because you've got an overflow box that goes up the side of your tank. I mean, even in this tank right here, this is my entire overflow, right? I mean, that's a wall of glass and there's acrylic on and there's teeth there. Here's my overflow box. Water is here and then it pours through the teeth into the outer box. If you have a tank with an internal overflow box, it's the same thing. Water's pouring over and in. If you put a lid on top of that, and then you put your auto feeder on the edge of it, then the food will drip down into the chimney that's penetrating the water the perfect amount. It's about this far in the water. It's perfect. Fish might even swim up into it. On the anemone cube, all the clowns go up into it when it's feeding time at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they just go nuts in there like sardines in a can. It's really cute. But yeah, I want to see it. I want to see how it works. Hey Chase, I'm glad to hear that worked out. I, I can't even remember when I sent that to you, but I'm glad that you were able to get it figured out. I know it was a little confusing at first. It actually says on the uh, information on that page, you'll have to take the driver apart the first time you're installing it, but then after that it's there forever. But uh, the reason I like it that way is it can't fall off no matter what. I mean, the bracket would have to unscrew from the wall to fall. You know, and that's why I like that it's the, the cable's threaded through it, reassembled, and that way, even if it's just bouncing around, it's still on top of the bracket. I've never had one fall, so that's why I made them that way. Okay, I'm looking for another question. Garrett says, my tank is full of these critters that resemble a potato bug. Do you know anything about them? You might be looking at amphipods, and they're on my critter ID section into the pod section. So take a look at the different pictures there. They kind of, or actually, Rather than an amphipod, probably an isopod, because those from the bottom, when you're, you know, you're, here's the, the glass, and the bug is on the glass. So we're looking at the bottom, the belly of the bug. It kind of looks like an ant. But when you get a side view of it, it kind of does have that roly-poly look to it, a potato bug look. So it might be an isopod, and isopods are not evil. And having pods in your tank is always a good thing, because the uh, other fish can eat them. And uh, it's, it's like live food that is being bred naturally in your tank. Devin says, if you have a 50 gallon a day RO system, can you change the membrane to 100? If the membrane housing is the right size, yes, but you also have to change the flow restrictor. So you want to always match the flow restrictor to the membrane. So if you have a 100 gallon a day membrane, you need a 100 gallon a day flow restrictor that they go together. If you have 150, you need that flow restrictor that matches it. Um, yours right now has a 50 gallon a day flow restrictor for that 50 gallon a day membrane. I just have this feeling that membrane is really small, like cute. <laughs> so maybe the 100 gallon a day membrane won't fit that housing. You might have to replace the housing on top too, but maybe you won't. So you could just, uh, you could try, you can get one and see what happens and maybe you'll be able to do it, but make sure you get the flow restrictor with it and install it. Take out the old one, put the new one in. Dustin says, will GFO strip out too much phosphate for the catamorpha to grow? It's possible if you're using too much. So you can always slow the flow through your reactor. You can use less GFO. Um, you need to add things to the refugium for the catamorpha to grow, which includes iron. Um, it needs to have adequate light, but not 24-hour day light. Catamorpha does not need light 24 hours a day. Nine hours a day is plenty. Uh, Michael Wells says, heard a rumor about a new MP40. I haven't heard anything, but now that Mobius is out with Versa and the new Radeon Gen 5s are out, I'm not surprised that there'd be a new MP40. Curious, though, I haven't heard anything. How did you hear before I heard? Ryan says, how easy are sumps? I've never had one but before, but I've, and I've always used canister filters. 
Well, I love a good sump. <laughs> I've been running sumps on all my tanks now for a long time because all the equipment's hidden under the tank, out of sight, so when you look at the tank, all you see is livestock. I try to have as little stuff as possible inside the display. Now, I know your canister filter is under the tank, probably, or behind the tank, so it's the same principle. It just gives you a little more flexibility, you have a little more space to do things, and you have increased the water volume of your system. It's so like if you had a 29-gallon aquarium and you added, let's say, a 15-gallon sump, you've just added like at least another seven gallons of water to your total setup. So now you have, you know, 36, 37 gallons of water volume instead of 24 gallons of water volume. So it, it's a benefit that way. You can put the heaters down there, you can put probes down there, you can dose down there, you can take water out during a water change. It's a lot of nice benefits to having one. And I have a huge article called What is a Sump on my website where you can read the entire thing and it'll cover a lot of questions for you. That article has been around for a long time and it still gets read to this day. Uh, the Grim Reefer says, I'm struggling with Aptasia. I'm using Aptasia X. Keep treating and a week later they've doubled in numbers. Try F Aptasia. F Aptasia is a new product that came out about two months ago and thousands of bottles have been sold. Not by me. And you know, I saw it on my website too. And I can ship that one for $6. So if, uh, by the way, I, I should have said this earlier. Uh, I try to always remind, remind you guys, if you're buying things from our website, I know shipping looks high. If I can find a cheaper rate, I will use it to save you money and send you a refund. Um, and it even says that during the checkout process, but if you don't pay attention, you won't see it. But it's there on the screen. And a lot of things I ship out are $6 shipping uh, during the week for little tiny things. When you say, hey, I want Live Rock Enhance, or I want this VCA nozzle, or I want uh, f -Aptasia. I can ship that for six, so you're not having to pay $17 for FedEx to deliver something that weighs four ounces. <laughs> it's crazy, right? But uh, the reason I, my website at this time does not have that one just built in de facto is because I had people buying an RODI system that's 18 pounds in a box 24 by 18 by 9, and they'd pick the you know priority mail for $6 or $7, and they're like, and when am I getting that? Because I picked priority, and I'm like, oh my god, you don't understand how shipping works. That is a huge box that weighs a ton. That's like $30 to ship to you. I'm not shipping to you for 6 And then they get mad at me. I'm like, Ugh. So I have to leave shipping the way it is, but I'm telling you guys, and like I said, it's on the website. It does let you know if there's an alternative that's cheaper, I'm going to use it, unless you tell me not to. You know, like some people like, do not use the post office. I had one customer get really mad at me for trying to save him money. He says, they always lose my mail. And wouldn't you know it, they lost that package too. And I had to reship via FedEx. And I was like, oh my God. So, I mean, you never know. But uh, F Aptasia creates like a frosting on top of the uh, Aptasia. And then a few days later, you break it up and you look underneath and it's gone. And people are using it for other things that they don't like, but it's designed to kill Aptasia. It'll also get rid of uh, Mahanos, but... Uh, like I said, people are using it on other things like vermitids or uh, clove polyps or, you know, there's like anything they can kill, they're using it. So uh, you could try that and you'll probably be successful with it. Um, we're going to go about another 13 minutes and then we're going to wrap this up. Um, Halco says, why does it look like your tank has different colored light on each side? Because right now, this is a 20K bulb, and this is a 20K bulb, but this is a 10K bulb. And in another seven minutes, this light's going to turn off, and it's going to turn back on. It's going to be a 20K bulb. Basically, I'm moving the sunlight across my reef every day. For the first hour and a half, each light does white light, and then it switches to blue, and the next one does white light, and then the next one. So you're watching the final one do white light right now. And then uh, it's called Staggered Lighting. I have a huge article about it on reefaddicts.com. And you can just type in staggered lighting Milev in Google and boom, you'll find my article and you can read it. And I've been doing it like this for a very long time. I enjoy it. It lets me see some blue light. I don't mind that there's different colors initially. After four o'clock all the way until seven o'clock, my entire tank is just glowing. It looks fantastic. And then the first light turns off at seven. The next one's off at 8.30. The next one's off at 9.15. And then Bert asks in all caps, have you ever had a problem with hydroids? <laughs> uh, no, nothing big. Occasionally I've seen some hydroids in my tank. I don't know why he's yelling at me. Um, I, sometimes hydroids happen and you can scrape them off. You can remove them with a dental tool and you can collect them and remove them. But uh, there actually is a nudibranch out there in this planet that eats them. And there's a video of it on my, on my uh, website. Not on YouTube. 
I mean, it's on YouTube, it's on my website. <laughs> Jose says, "Did you ins have you installed the X the Reefbrite XHO on the Radeon yet? If yes, what's your opinion? I haven't yet. Sorry, I've even told Tulio I haven't had time yet. I'm literally one project after another. I feel like I'm never catching up." Uh, Alexandru says, "I have a Ganyapora that doesn't want to open up anymore. Do you know why that might ha might be happening?" Well, it could be starving to death. It could be. A neighboring coral is irritating it. It could be a fish is picking on it. Ganyapora are not easy corals. They are notoriously difficult. They were sold to people like hand over fist back in the day. Uh, everyone's like, oh, I want the flower pot coral. I love that coral. And they made it seem like anyone could keep them and everyone was killing them. So uh, I myself have not had much luck with Ganyas either. I've, I've tried a couple in the years and I've had a couple really nice ones for a little while, but they didn't stay with me long term. So they actually need specific food. There's a food that is made by two little fishies called Ganyo Power. And it I do sell it in the shop if you want to use that for your Gani. But if it's closed, it's not going to eat anything. Um, you could also try Reefroids or Benepets. Those are both uh, coral foods that seem to work well for a lot of different corals. But like I said, if that coral's closed up, I mean, you're going to find out why it's closed up. Um, and you can, especially at night when the when it's dark, Turn off all the lights in the room, just leave the light on on the tank, and sit down away from your tank and just watch. Stare at your tank for 10 minutes or so and see if anything is going at that Ganyapora. Or check on it after it lights out and see if there's something that's sending sweepers that are stinging it. Um, it might be something like that. Dan says, when vodka dosing, should water changes still be done? You can, uh, because you're just growing bacteria with the vodka dosing, and you're not going to lose the bacteria during the water change. If you are siphoning your sand bed like a gravel vac, you could be sucking out bacteria. So there is a downside there. So maybe you do smaller water changes. And when you say them, I mean, are you doing one a month? Are you doing them every day? Are you doing them weekly? You know, all that comes into play. But, you know, usually a 25% per month water change will suffice. Uh, Lynn says, you said you don't make aquariums, only sumps. So can you make me a 100-gallon sump with no baffles and a center overflow? <laughs> I sure can! <laughs> yeah, I really don't make display tanks, but I mean, yeah, it's possible. And that one's not too big. My frag tank I made uh, four years ago, it's a 60-gallon. It's made of 3 8 looks great. Well, it looks abused. <laughs> I'm, when I reset it, I'm going to polish it because I've scuffed up the front panel something fierce. But uh, that was a good one. I like that. Hey, Spock. Ryan says hi. Spock! Oh, I'm sorry. Ray says hi. Ray says hi! All right. Trent says, I bought a used tank. The silicone is dyed blue. What? Due to what he said was ick medication, would bleach work to fix this? Nope, that is a tank that's had copper in it, and you cannot use that for a display tank. Go get yourself a nice new clean tank with nice new healthy silicone. That is going to be a permanent quarantine tank for sick fish. Uh, Sean is using a low dose of lanthanum chloride every single day with a doser and finds that it works better and doesn't get the tank cloudy, and that's fine. Uh, Michael Wells says, if money was no object, what fish would, that you don't have already would you like to put in your tank? Um, well, really, it's not the money part. I mean, yeah, I can't afford it, but <laughs> it comes down to, if I really like a certain fish, will it live harmoniously with my corals? Or is my tank running the water cold enough for that fish and not affect all the livestock. For, for example, if we pick the peppermint angel fish, which is a beautiful little angel, just a gorgeous little dwarf angel, um, I think that tank water has to be like 74, 75 degrees, maybe even 73. I keep my reef around 78 to 80. So it's too warm for that fish. That doesn't work, even though, like you said, if money didn't matter. So I had this free money, I can buy that fish. Will it, will, will it live? Or if I got a conspict angel, which is a conspiculatus, it's a beautiful angel fish, comes from around uh, 
Lorgoensis uh, near Australia. That fish is gorgeous, but it's a coral eater. <laughs> you know, you can get that one for like $5,000, but it's going to do some destruction. So it really comes down to when you say money is no object, it also means a spot for another tank and more things to plug in and another thing to maintain. But uh, I would like to get a potter's angel, and that's not even a money problem. That's just a matter of getting one that lives. Uh, I think they're beautiful. They're really pretty. Um, the potter's angel is nice. There was another one. Oh, the interruptus. But that's only beautiful when it's a juvenile. And when it becomes a bigger angel, it's kind of blah. But when it's a baby, it's got all these dots in its face. It's gorgeous. I love that one. So, um, those would be a couple I'd like to get, and that's not even a money thing. Um, Dave says, new products and upgraded products come out eventually. What is your recommendation to upgrading if the current product you have is still working fine and does the job? Good. Then why spend the money? You know, if you have gear that works for you and your tank is rocking along just fine, there's no necessary need to upgrade. How many people have asked me, why are you still running metal halides? And you know, why don't you have LEDs over your tank? You know, I don't understand. You could save so much money. I love the way my tank looks under metal halides. So I run it that way. And uh, it works. And I've got an extra ballast. I've got extra bulbs. You know, I just keep going. But eventually, someday, maybe I might have to switch to LEDs. I don't know. But I haven't seen the need, so I didn't make the change. I ran the same protein skimmer for 14 years before I got the NIOS. And I got the NIOS sent to me as a product review, and they let me keep it, <laughs> which was nice. And uh, I still run that skimmer to this day. Um, there's a lot of things I use for a long, long time, even though new stuff comes out. But there's other stuff I jump on, like when the Comor came out with a little X1 uh, Bluetooth pump. As soon as the one was available, I got it. When the Comor came out with the EXT calcium reactor pump, or the FXP pump, I bought that one the minute we could buy it in the U.S. You know, I jumped on it. The new Radeon Gen 5 came out. I ordered one for my frag tank. So sometimes I jump on it. I have a dead light over the frag tank, and it's a Gen 2. So I'm going to... I should have already taken it down because it's dead. Um, I'm going to cut it down. I'm going to put up the Gen 5 in its spot, and it's going to be great. Uh, the person asked me about my lights. See? That light just turned off. So it's just after 4 o'clock. It must be 4 o'clock on the Apex. And in a moment here, it's going to start lightening up as that light switches to 20K. So yeah, there's no reason to change gear if your tank is doing well. Uh, Sean says, do you think that your sand has been reduced or dissolved over the year due, due to buffering your alkalinity? Actually, uh, what happens with the deep sand bed is that the, the deeper section has less oxygen in it, and the sand bed is calcium-based, so it dissolves itself. And so sand over time dissipates, and you have to replenish. And when I had my 280, I used to put in two bags of sand uh, every, uh, well, two bags a year. Every six months, I put a bag of sand in my tank <laughs> to keep up with that tank. And on this one here, I haven't put any new sand in here in forever. I cleaned it when I had to replace the tank. Didn't lose much in the process because I rinsed everything really well. And now at this point, it's just time for some fresh sand. And I don't want to just put in reef flakes. I want to put in reef flakes live to add some new beneficial bacteria. So I'm planning to buy a few bags of that from them. Uh, Michael Wells says the other option instead of a RAS inside the quarantine tank would be use black mollies permanently so you can see ick on them first, like a canary in the coal mine type of situation. Let us know how it goes. I, I wouldn't do it. Um, two minute warning. Uh, yeah, matter of fact, uh, so I'm just going to answer one more question and then I'm going to go ahead and jump to uh, the closing. <laughs> So, <clears throat> John says, how are you faring out with the Comor FX pump, uh, STP calcium reactor pump you added to your system? I ran it for probably a year, um, I guess, maybe longer. And I recently replaced it with a Versa pump. And uh, so that's how I'm faring. <laughs> I had it for a long time. It was okay. It kind of made some clicking noises. If it was a, in a contained cabinet where you couldn't hear it, that would have been better. But since everything's wide open, I can hear everything. I can hear a drop of water in my house. So I uh, was aware of that. I oiled it up with something, and it got super silent. And then I could actually hear the pump humming. You know, the actual sound of a pool pump, basically, was just emanating and bothering me because my tank is so super quiet that uh, 
I went to the verse and I'm using the verse now for about a month and now I'm hearing some kind of a weird gratch, gratch, gratch. I'm like, I don't know why. So <laughs> it's going to be impossible to have dead silent when you have something that's moving all the time, especially in open air. But uh, I switched from that to the Versa. I want to try it out. And actually, I ordered a bunch of Versas to put on my website. So if you guys are looking to get the Versa pump, um, that'll be on the site shortly, along with the Prodibio. So this is Water Test Saturday. Please do test your water. I told you guys I wanted to show you something. Let me grab my phone. Let's see how many of you are still here, because you're probably all like, oh, let me hang up. He's done. Not done yet. I've got something to show you. So let me plug in my phone. And... Let's see. I see nothing yet. It's weird. Usually... Whoa! Sorry about that. I plugged in my phone and it like shut down the system. I don't know what was trying to happen there. That was weird. Let me try this really quick. Put this in airplane mode. I'm gonna try one more time to plug in my phone. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's acting, it's doing something new. All right. Hmm. I think this software changed. All right, I can't do it. Uh, the software changed uh, for my uh, streaming software, and it used to be I could detect the phone and you show you the screen, but when I did it now, it's acting like it's a camera, So, and I just updated, so apparently something has changed in their software, so I'm just going to show you. This is the new Reef Trace screen. Uh, it's new, and it's coming out next week for iOS. So when you touch it, tap it right here, now you've got your list of parameters right here. I'm looking at uh, all my phosphate numbers. And then if you want to see your entire list, you hit all. And then you have a whole list of parameters here. And you can look at things that way. And then when you find your parameter that you're caring about, like for example, let's say alkalinity. My alkalinity is very boring because it's, um, it's always nine. <laughs> but you can take your app and you can turn it sideways and you get a graph. So that's something new that's in there. And uh, that is the new look with all these little widgets. It's really awesome. I'm really liking that. And I've been testing it and working out the bugs for the last couple of little revisions, and that's rolling out any day now. So today is water test Saturday. You're going to need to test your, your water with whatever test kits you have. Mine are sitting here ready for me. I have a bunch of ELOS test kits, and I have an API test kit for nitrate because it's the only one that measures high enough. Um, you want to test your magnesium, calcium, phosphate, nitrate, uh, alkalinity. We want to check temperature, we want to check pH, you want to check salinity. You want to double check every single thing. Um, and that way, once you have all this information, you know if you need to make any changes on your tank, please don't just look at your tank and say, it's fine, my corals are fine. Use your test kits because you know what? For every minute you're not using them, they're going expired. They're going bad anyway. So you might as well use them because that's why you bought them. And if you didn't buy them, go buy some because you need test kits. <laughs> it's the only way to solve a problem in your tank. So you want to know what's going on. And I know sometimes it's almost like dread. You're testing your water, you're like, oh, what's going to be wrong now? I understand that mentality. I get it. it. Happens to me too, but at the same time, that's just how life is. We want to find out what's going on. Just like when you take your car in for an inspection and they have to check and see if everything's okay, you know, there, something might need to be fixed. But we want to stay on top of things because the animals in our tanks rely on us to stay alive and we want to make sure that they're surviving. I hope you guys have a great weekend. We will have another live stream next Saturday at 2 o'clock Central Time. And uh, in the meantime, if you are looking for a place to hang out, we have a group on Facebook called Club Mila's Reef, and you are welcome to join. I, I just, a couple days ago, added all the people that came from YouTube. They, you are my chosen ones, and so <laughs> I add you guys because you're on this YouTube live stream. And so that way we can share pictures of our tank and talk about things and do polls and, uh, you know, just kind of have a nice camaraderie all throughout the week instead of just waiting for Saturday. And uh, a couple of videos will drop this week because, I, like I said, I'm almost caught up with everybody. And that way I can sit down and get a couple of things edited I want to roll out. So you've got that coming up this week, and then I'll see you guys next Saturday. Bye!